Hi, welcome all to our two-part day of day two for the Speak Out for Engineering Global Finals event and award ceremony. Welcome back to all of you who were here with us yesterday and welcome to those who are joining us for the first time today. For those who have just joined in, I would like to give a brief recap of our event thus far. I'm your Master of Ceremonies, Samantha Diraj, and I'm a the young member representative for the Americas, as well as a volunteer within the institution for the past six years. I have a background in engineering asset management, and I currently work within the tech field. I've actually competed at the 2017 Global Sophie Finals, and it was quite a rewarding experience for me. Aside from the judges' feedback and takeaway, I had the opportunity to network and meet a lot of great people who today I now call friends, the other competitors. So just to give you a brief recap of exactly what is Speak Out for Engineering. Speak Out for Engineering is basically a competition designed for young engineers to help develop verbal and visual communication skills in explaining technical mechanical related subjects. The competition is organized and run annually by the young members of the institution established back in 1964. And it continues to really challenge young engineers, prove that they can communicate effectively. It is specifically concerned with the verbal and visual communication in describing technical related subjects. Today, you would see oral presentations on mechanical engineering subjects which will be broken down into a presentation of 20 minutes and a Q&A session, which I encourage the audience to participate in for 10 minutes. The Speak Out for Engineering competition, it takes place across the globe. Winners from each heat are then invited to compete in the regional final, and the winners from the regional final are then in invited to participate in the Grand Global Final, which we are at today. The winner of this will then be crowned the overall global SOFI winner. To ensure the safety of all competitors, the IMECI members, volunteers, and employers at the institution, the originally planned SOFI Global Final, which was due to take place in Abu Dhabi earlier this year, was canceled as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions on travel. Thus, in recognition of all of the hard work that our competitors has placed, to ensure an overall winner is crowned for the first time since its inception, we're having the global final right here on a virtual platform. This two-part final will bring together the 2019 champions from the eight regions, the Americas, Europe, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, Middle East and Africa, Southern Asia, Oceania, UK and Ireland, to battle it out one last time to see who will be crowned the overall 2019 SOFI winner. All attendees are well. I encourage to submit your questions throughout the presentation via the chat box, which will be moderated, and we will then pose them to the competitors. So please, I encourage your participation. Yesterday, just to give you a brief recap, we had presentations from the Middle East and Africa, Mohammed Hasib Kazim, Europe, Ukte Guchlu, the Americas, Jeremy Lalchan, and the UK, Kayla Wilson. Today, we have some exciting presentations lined up from the Oceania region for Geralo Tegush, Northeast Asia, Selena Winhe, Southeast Asia, Christine Tan Chinmin, and South Asia, Bahim Assam Anik. So please, I remind you all where the agenda is located, right where you're viewing, right at the bottom. And once all the competitors have presented today, there will be a short break for the judges' deliberations, and then you're invited to the award ceremony. At this ceremony, this will be conducted by our president, Terry Spall, and the prizes funded by the institution's trustee boards committee will be awarded to the winner and the runner up. This year, we have a great panel of judges lined out. Some you may know already, for those of you who were here yesterday, but nevertheless, I'm gonna do a brief introduction to each judge. Just to give you an overview, the judges will be looking for the structure and content of the presentation, quality, preparation, and handling of questions. That's why we encourage you all to ask as many questions as you can to the participants, because they will be being judged on this. Again, just to reiterate, 90% of the total marks are given for the presentation and only 10% for the technical content. 
This ensures that while all presentations must have a mechanical engineering content in its broadest sense, a topic concerning, say, comparatively low technology has an equal chance of success as one with technologically very complex. So just let's delve into the judge's introduction, yeah? So our first judge, which is our head judge and award presenter, the 135th present, present, president of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Terry Spall. Well, thank you, Samantha, and a uh, very warm welcome to everybody. Uh, as Samantha said, I am the 135th president of the Institution of uh, Mechanical Engineers. Uh, our first president back in 1847 was in fact George Stevenson, who gave the world the locomotive. Well, his achievements go well beyond my own. But my presidency comes after a 40-year 40, 40 career in the automotive industry and 31 of those as a chartered uh, mechanical engineer. Um, I really can't stress enough the importance of engineers having the ability to present and communicate effectively. It's a real skill uh, and it may well be one of the most useful skills you'll ever develop throughout your career. Uh, and it can have a very, very positive impact if you do it well. And I'm speaking from experience because I actually was a competitor in the Speak Out for Engineering competition back in 1985. Um, at that time, it was known as the Queen's Silver Jubilee competition. And I've gone on to develop and uh, perfect my presentation skills over the years. And they've enabled really me to make the journey really from, from apprentice to board director and now to, to president. So I'm looking forward to working with my fellow judges and hearing some of the really great presentations. And I wish all the candidates the very best of luck. Thank you, Terry. Our next judge, director, member of operations of the IMECI, Joanna Horton. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Sam, and, and uh, hello, everybody, uh, for the second day of, of the competition. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing all the competitors um, uh, today. Um, as Sam said, my name is Joanna Horton, and I'm Institution Director for Member Operations. I've worked in the charity sector for about 25 years now, and within IMECI, I'm responsible uh, for the delivery of volunteer support and our member facing services, no matter where a member is based around the world. So as well as being excited to be a judge today, I'm very much looking forward um, to seeing how you find the competition, um, if you hopefully find it both engaging and rewarding. And uh, lastly, a plea to you all that if you do enjoy it, we'd love to, we'd love to work with you going forward um, to help uh, volunteer um, yourselves as part of the organisation and how we can help your career develop. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Our next judge, an engineering policy advisor, Carly Nettleford. Hi, Carly. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as Sam said, my name is Carly Nettleford. I'm an engineering policy officer for the IMECI, and I started earlier this year. Um, we saw some great presentations yesterday, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys today. Um, I wish you all the best of luck, and hopefully we'll see some fantastic ideas today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carly. And our final judge for today, Stephen Francis, our judge and Toastmaster. Hi, Stephen. Hi, thanks, Sam. I'm Stephen from Malaysia. I have been in Toastmasters for 26 years, and I saw some beautiful speeches yesterday. I'm looking forward to see more today. Thank you so much. Thank you to our wonderful judging panel. We do appreciate you, and we look forward to your feedback today. Thank you again, judges. And now for part one of the exciting part of our day, the competition. Our first competitor is from the Oceania region, Geraldo Tegush. Geraldo is a chartered mechanical engineer with design analysis and project management experience in rotating machinery, wind energy, and wave energy consultancy. He just completed his master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nottingham in the UK. And today we will be seeing his presentation, Ocean Wave Energy. Good day. Greetings from Melbourne, Australia. My name is Geraldo, representing the Oceania region, and I'll be presenting Ocean Wave Energy. I'm going to describe what it is, why is it important, how it could be harvested from the ocean, and the current development in making it everyday power source for the society. I'm going to start my presentation by bringing up a hot topic, climate change. This image here is taken from The Economist magazine in September 2019, The Climate Issues. 
This image represents the average temperature in every year since 1850s. The color blue is colder, and as the decades they cut, the story becomes clear. Our Earth is getting warmer. The color has changed into red. And thankfully, the world realizes that prevention and early management are better than cure. Countries have agreed that renewable energy is an international effort to combat climate change. Now, when it comes to renewable energy, you may be familiar with wind energy, solar energy, but wave energy? Not so popular. This presentation aims to raise the awareness of wave energy converter development. Before we continue, let me share a bit about my background. I graduated from the University of Nottingham, Masters in Mechanical Engineering. I then started working for Formax Technology, an engineering consultancy based in Nottingham. And here, I gained the experience working on electric vehicle projects, wind energy, and wave energy projects. I moved to Melbourne last year, and I'm currently working as a consultant engineer for Wood. Wood is fully committed in supporting our clients in meeting the energy transition and climate change goal. This includes supporting significant projects in ocean energy sector. Ocean energy refers to all forms of renewable energy derived from the sea. The primary forms are thermal energy, wave energy, and tidal energy. In this presentation, I will focus solely on wave energy. There are three parts of my presentation. I will start from wave energy, talking about the potential, the origin, benefits, and challenges. Then we'll move to wave energy converter, where we'll look at the components, different types of devices, and the essential features. And lastly, wave energy converter development, where I will share my experience working for Wave Energy Scotland project and the Wave Energy projects here in Australia. Let's begin. Wave Energy. When you look at the damage that the waves can cause to coastal structure, you'll be convinced that they contain large amount of energy. Wave energy refers to the extraction of kinetic and potential energy from the ocean surface waves, converting it into another useful form. In 2012, it is estimated there's up to 50 terawatt hours of practical wave energy that can be harvested from the UK waters. Now to put this number into context, the total electricity consumption in the UK just last year was almost 300 terawatt hour. So wave energy could contribute up to 17% green energy. The ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. So location with most potential for wave energy include the western seaboard of Europe, the northern coast of the UK, the Pacific coastline of North and South America, Southern Africa, New Zealand, and here in Australia. So tapping into this effectively, will be a major boost to global renewable ambition. So where does the energy come from? As waves travel through relatively deep water, the motion of the water particle is more or less circular. Wave energy converters aim to extract the energy from this elliptical motion. The magnitude of the motion is greater at the surface or slightly below, and this is why most of wave energy converters operate at slightly below the surface or at the surface. Now closer to the land, the particle motion is compressed into ellipses with more horizontal displacement than vertical displacement. 
Here are the benefits of wave energy. Wave energy has greater predictability compared to wind and solar. Wave energy is limitless. Wave energy can take advantage of open waters. So minimum land infrastructure is required. Wave has high energy density. For every meter of wave, it's estimated about 30 to 40 kilowatt energy. However, there are a few challenges that wave energy face. Wave energy device must withstand stormy weather. It may be unpleasant for some who live close to the sea, and it may create hazard for some of the creatures near it. The cost of this technology is still high at the moment. Now let's move on to wave energy comfort. When I type wind energy on Google, this is what I get. White power structure with three blades. However, when I search for wave energy, this is what I get. So you can see, compared to wind, it's quite different. There are a lot of various concepts here, and the architecture has not converged yet. There's no single three-bladed solution for wave energy converter. However, it's possible for us to group them based on their mode of operations. Before I show you different concepts of wave energy converter, let me show you the components of wave energy converter. So first, we have the prime mover, which is the main physical structure that interacts with the wave motion. It converts particle motion of the wave into a more conventional mechanical motion. The energy is then transferred from the prime mover to power takeoff or PTO, allowing it to be further converted into electricity. There are other components such as the control system, foundation and moorings, and the electrical infrastructure to transport the electricity back to the land. Here are different concepts of the prime mover. First, we have the attenuators, where two buoyant bodies connected by a single axis in the middle. We have point absorbers, which moves up and down. It's generally non-directional, which means that they're able to receive waves coming from any direction. Oscillating wave surge converters, where the power takeoff resists the motion between the flat and the base. Is typically placed closer to the land, making use of the horizontal motion. There are other concepts out there, such as rotating mass devices, barge wave devices, and oscillating water column. We'll see the use of the last concept here in Australia at the last part of my presentation. The following features are essential for wave energy converter to show long-term economic potential has to be able to survive the harsh marine environment and it would be very beneficial if most or all the maintenance could be done on the platform itself without having to bring the device all the way to the land. Wave energy converter must consist of efficient wave energy absorbing technology and the power takeoff. Now all these essential features need to be included in our last section Wave energy converter development. In general, there are three keys to successful product innovation. First, it has to be desirable or usable by an end user. It has to be technically feasible and economically viable. Now, these key elements do not have to be developed at the same time, since the developer needs to start somewhere. However, they need to be present in some kind of harmony in order the innovation can successfully be launched on the market. In the first section of this presentation, we looked at the benefits of wave energy and how it could benefit the society. In the second section, we have looked at impressive wave energy technology. And currently, it is estimated there are about 200 wave energy converter development. So this indicates the tremendous effort that's been put into this technology. 
So the missing piece is the business case. Now the most important metric for energy generation is the levelized cost of energy. How much does it cost to generate each megawatt of electricity over the life? You can reduce this cost by reducing the capital expenditure, reducing the operational expenditure, or increasing the energy production. Here are the estimated costs for wind and solar. How about wave energy? This is where Wave Energy Scotland comes in. West was formed in 2014 at the request of Scottish government. This program is driving the search for an innovative solution to the technical challenges that wave energy face. The levelized cost of energy target is 150 pounds sterling per megawatt hour. This program is founded on competitive stage-gated process, which various projects developing each of the component of wave energy converter. The aim is to remove the risk and develop each ingredient, combine all of them together, to have a full-scale working device. Now, during my time in Romex, I was working in one of the power takeoff projects. I will share my experience just to show you what it takes to develop a component of a wave energy converter. The core technology that we're proposing is very similar to William speed wind turbine gearbox. To put it simply, we try to take the wind turbine gearbox, connect it to generator, making it waterproof, connect it to wave energy converter, and see how it works. Now, the key advantages to these concepts are firstly, high transmission efficiency, and secondly, its ability to take advantage of the highly cost-competitive supply chain. This supply chain has already existed in supplying components for wind energy sector. So for this project, the aim is to develop the control system and estimate the energy production by comparing three different layouts. We started off by creating the full-scale concept of the layouts. We have the baseline, differential, and rectifying layout. And then we created a simplified version of these planetary gears configurations by using chains and sprockets. These test scale concepts faithfully represent the kinematic and dynamic properties of the full-scale concept. We then developed a test rig and control system and connected it to a wave energy converter, the mini version of it, of course. Here is the picture of the 25th scale of wave energy converter device by C-Power, and we tested the performance in FlowWave Ocean Energy Research Facility located at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. This is a short clip of when the wave energy converter is being tested in a simulated sea state condition. Now the tank testing allowed us to test the control system and assess the wave energy converter behavior in various sea states. So hopefully this will give you a glimpse of activities involved in wave energy converter development. Now let's look at what's happening here in the land down under. CSIRO has worked together with ARENA to create Australian Wave Energy Atlas. The result of this project shows that the wave energy could power up up to 11% of Australia's energy. This is enough to power a city the size of Melbourne by 2050. The potential of wave energy in Australia is great. In line with the potential of wave energy in Australia, I'm glad to be connected with Australian Ocean Energy Group, which facilitates collaboration throughout the wave and tidal energy industry. The founding partners include leading energy organization, 
Australian research institution, innovators, and subject matter experts across Australia and the world. The aim of this organization is to accelerate commercialization of Australia's ocean sector and providing opportunities to bring end users together. There are several wave energy projects here in Australia. One of them is not too far from where I am, Uniwave 200 in Island project. Uniwave 200 is a 200 kilowatt wave energy converter to be deployed near King Island in Tasmania. The developer is Wastewell Energy, and this project is supported by the Australian Renewable Agency, RENA. This is an innovative unidirectional oscillating water column, the first in the world, compared to bidirectional technology, which is typical in oscillating water column. The comprehensive tank testing has shown competitive advantage, and it is expected to be demonstrated at full scale of this project. This device can double as a form of cost of protection as well. This project began in March 2019, and I'm very excited when the CEO told me that it is scheduled to be deployed as soon as early next year. We have seen that wave energy has great untapped potential. Wave energy converter, there are several prime mover concepts out there, but the architecture has not converged yet. Wave energy converter development is ongoing with strong focus in solving the technical and economic challenges. This is why it's important. Wave energy can be a key tool to combat climate change. It will be financially viable to supply world's electricity demand in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you to Geraldo Tegush. Nice to meet you. And we've just seen his presentation, Ocean Wave Energy. We now open the session to our judges and the audience for your questions. Audience, please remember, drop your questions on the box on the side and we will moderate and ask accordingly. We now pass it over to Terry and the judges. Uh, well, thank you, Sam. And uh, thank you, Geraldo. That's a really interesting presentation. So thank you very much for that. I learned a little bit about wave energy then, which is great. Um, my question thank really you. goes back to kind of the middle part of your presentation where you showed us uh, different kinds of technologies, different kinds of devices to extract uh, energy from waves. I'd like to ask you, which of those is the most efficient mechanically in terms of extracting energy? And does it follow that that is also the most efficient economically? Yes, so the answer to your question is that it's still being developed. So various developers are racing to prove that they are the best. And so I guess uh, we will find out in the near future. At the moment, uh, it's still a very early stage of development. So they are mostly on the prototype stage or half scale. OK, great. And then for the... Um... The technology that you worked on with uh, with Romax, um, yeah, would, would you know um, how efficient that device was in terms of converting uh, wave energy into electrical energy? Yes, yeah, so we connected our power takeoff concept to a, a generator concept, which is the one that has two body connecting axis in the middle, and we tested it on the twenty fifth scale of the device. And we managed to be quite close to the levelized cost of energy target uh, in one of the design concepts. So it proves to be, be quite efficient. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Geraldo. Thank you. Go on. Hi, Geraldo. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is around the sort of more comparison between wind energy and 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 wave. You, you mentioned there was great potential in Melbourne. I think it was um, about powering that city through through wave energy. But sort of in in society, a lot more is known about wind energy perhaps than 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 wave. How do you think you could, how do you think we should go about sort of um, enabling society to know about more about it and therefore back it more? Yeah, so I think wave energy is not there to replace wind energy. In fact, it should be complementing each other. Wave energy is more predictable compared to wind energy. So I think if we make the society more aware of wave energy potential, um, they will be more inclined to support wave energy projects. And that will hopefully push the government to provide more funding uh, that has already been poured to wind energy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jamaldo. That was really, really interesting. Um, my question is, you said that um, wave energy is really important in terms of combating climate change. What else would you say are the most important things that need to happen for us to combat climate change? I think it starts from ourselves um, on our day-to-day -day activities, um, choosing uh, the product that we use on a daily basis, our dietary as well and also the importance of recycling. Great. Thank you. Ronaldo, thank you. I think you educated me on something that I never knew before. Fantastic. Now, if you were thank funded you. for this project, and what would you do, what would be your strategy to promote this wave energy? In terms of raising the or developing yeah. the technology in raising the awareness in raising the awareness okay so firstly i will approach uh, university students i will um, present my presentation to them and also i will go as far as the primary students as well primary school students just to raise this awareness um, i will be working with the government sector and also the private sectors, the wave energy developers, to promote this um, in events and also competition like this. Thank you, thank you, Gerardo. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to our judging panel. We appreciate your questions. Uh, Geraldo, we have a question from the audience. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Not all countries or regions are able to harvest wave energy. What are the key requirements or conditions that must be met so that the wave energy technology can be applied? Okay, so in my presentation, I showed some of the areas where the wave energy is high in terms of the density. So the key requirements are Firstly, the support from the local government in terms of the regulation and also the infrastructure, the grid connectivity. And I guess it's also useful to have existing uh, renewable energy projects in, in the place so that the society can have full support on this. Thank you for your question. Um, any more questions from the audience? If not, I'll ask, uh, are there any more questions from our judging panel? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Geraldo. Nice to meet you. And thank you again for your presentation and your question and answers. And we will now be moving forward to our second presentation for today. Our next competitor will be representing Northeast Asia, Selena Yip Wing Hei. Selena is currently a graduate trainee in a Hong Kong electrical power company, the CLP Power Hong Kong Limited. 
She received her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Hong Kong in 2019. Prior to graduating, she has worked in the fields of material and soft robotics. Today, we will be viewing Selena's presentation, Light Stimulated Actua Based on Nickel Hydroxide Oxyhydroxide for Robotics. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the IMAC Key Speak Out for Engineering presentation. I'm Selena. I'm a mechanical engineering graduate from the University of Hong Kong and I'm currently working as a graduate trainee in the Hong Kong Electrical Power Company. This presentation, I'd like to introduce you to something that I've worked on for my final year in university a light simulated actuator based on nickel hydroxide oxyhydroxide. Moreover, we will explore its potential in robotics application. In this presentation, I would like to first introduce you to the thin film actuator made with nickel hydroxide oxyhydroxide. Specifically, I would like to focus on its characterization, actuation principle, and performance. Moreover, I will give a short demonstration of how the actuator actually work in real life. And lastly, we will talk about how we can realize the actuator potential in robotic applications. In the last decades, the field of robotics is accelerating at an increasingly rapid rate. From the first mind control robotic arm to humanoids that can do parkour, robotics is showing no signs of slowing down. What else do you think does the future hold for robotics? Recently, Science Robotics conducted an online survey on major unsolved challenges in robotics. Based on the submission received, they shortlisted 10 grand challenges that may have major breakthrough, significant research, and socioeconomic impact in the next 5 to 10 years. Developing new materials for creating new generations of robots that are power efficient, multifunctional, and and autonomous in ways akin to biological organisms is one of the 10 greatest challenges. In particular, there is tremendous interest worldwide in developing smart actuators to replace the conventional electromechanical actuator. In robotics, actuators are frequently used as a mechanism to convert energy to provide motion or to apply force. And typically, there are several types of actuators such as hydraulic, pneumatic, and electrical actuators. They have been the core of motion and force power for the majority of robotic structure. Then, why are we trying to develop these so-called smart actuators when we have been using these conventional ones for years? Although there are the devices that we normally go for when we like to control some mechanisms, they do exhibit some disadvantage. For example, pneumatic actuators are well known for having low efficiency and high operational cost. Hydraulic actuators, on the other hand, are notorious for leaking fluids. Electrical actuators are expensive, produce small force, moreover, they can overheat and cannot be used in hazardous or inflammable areas. Above all, the force supplied and the volume of these actuators is usually a natural limitation. They impose roadblocks in realizing robust and efficient robotic structure. And considering these drawbacks, scientists and engineers are greatly interested in developing smart actuators for robotics. And this is why the last two decades have seen a surge in interest in developing smart actuators. There are actuators that can be actuated intrinsically by certain stimuli in a self-contained way, without the need of any mechanical components such as gears, valves, and motors. Recently, a novel material system, nickel hydroxide oxyhydroxide, has been developed in the University of Hong Kong. Actuators fabricated by these material can be actuated by various stimuli such as electricity, light, and change in humidity to give reversible bending and curling motion. 
In this presentation, I'd like to focus on the light trip and actuation. Since material that can be triggered by light to give fast, quick, and strong deformation has never been achieved. This actuator overcomes the problem encountered in conventional actuator, such as lubricant leakage, overheating, and restriction in hazardous environments. Moreover, its flexible and miniaturized body allows a surplus of freedom and flexibility to interact with its surrounding. Moreover, it allows us to develop robots with safe contact and can interact safely with human. And lastly, the light drip and actuation allows us to develop robots that can be operated wirelessly. In other words, this actuator has tremendous interest in, in developing robotics. Before we go deeper into how we can realize the potential of this actuator, let me explain further the thin film actuator. The film actuator does not consist of a homogeneous material structure. Rather, it is composed of three layers and each contributes differently towards a working actuator. Firstly, nickel metal layer acts as a passive substrate and provides support to the film actuator. On top, there is a thin intermediate layer of gold, which protects the nickel from dissolving during the electroplating of the hydroxide layer. Moreover, this gold possesses high visible light absorbance, which improve the actuator response to light. And lastly, nickel hydroxide oxyhydroxide acts as, a path, acts as an active layer, which is responsible to the light drip and actuation. Some of you might be wondering, how actually can this actuator be actuated without any electrical power or mechanical parts. To put it briefly, nickel hydroxide oxyhydroxide exhibits a turbo striking crystal structure capable of intercalating water molecules. These water molecules can be reversibly distorted into the environment under visible light. And the removal of water molecules results in a volume decrease of the hydroxide layer. And since the volume of nickel and gold is not affected by the illumination of light, the contraction of the hydroxide layer causes the tri-layer actuator to bend and curl. We can actually control the shape that the actuator gives by giving it light of different intensity. For example, the actuator bends slightly if illuminated by light at low intensity. On the other hand, it can curl into loops if we shine light of higher intensity. And to give you a real and closer look of how the actuator actually works, I have brought with me a few models. As you can see, when shined light, the actuator bends lightly. And if we move closer to the actuator, it will curl into loops. And if we remove the light source, the actuator will return to its original shape. At this point, some of you are probably quite skeptical of this actuator that looks like a piece of aluminum foil that I took from my home's kitchen. However, its performance can actually rival with conventional actuator. For example, it can, give, it can be triggered by light almost instantaneously to give fast deformation. It can be actuated quickly at 30 degrees per second under visible light of, it, of an intensity at 5 milliwatt per centimeter square. If we increase the light intensity to 10 to 100 milliwatt per centimeter square, it can be actuated rapidly at 60 to 400 degrees per second. On the other hand, the actuator is capable to give out high actuation force. It is measured that the force given out by a 0.3 milligram actuator can reach a, can reach a thousand milligram, which is over 3,000 times of its own weight. Moreover, the actuation performance is highly repeatable, as demonstrated in a visible light cyclic actuation test. 
the actuator is able to give up similar actuation strain for 5,000 cycles. And lastly, since the majority of the material is nickel, the material cost of a typical actuator is as low as half a dollar per centimeter square, and it can be easily fabricated within an hour. So, now that we have a basic idea of what the actuator is capable of, let's explore its potential in robotic application. Robots are machines that are able to perform a complex series of actions automatically, usually programmed by computers. If we type in the word robot, robots into Google, we are able we obtain images that are almost exclusively rigid in structure. And this is because for many, many years, we have been developing robots with strong emphasis on speed and precision. Ro robots like these can perform the same task millions of times with minimal error. However, and this translates to very specific architecture. There are usually well-defined sets of rigid parts, links, and actuators However, their rigidity often limits how they are used. With this, robot, with this rigid robotic structure, we have to measure perfectly our environment and program every movement. Any slight error can result in very large faults. For example, a small error in the measurement, and that's it, face to the ground and there's no turning back. A small error in the program the robot misses the doorknobs and fall over. As we can see, what makes a robot strong and precise is actually making them extremely effective in the real world. And this is because their body cannot deform or better adjust to the environment. And this is why we have a new field called soft robotics. The main objective is not to develop, to develop super precise and strong robots, but to make machines that can deal with unexpected situations in the real world. Inspired by animals and plants, these robots are equipped with soft structures and high flexibility. They, unlike, their rigid, unlike the conventional rigid robots, they can achieve functionality unattainable by the conventional robots, such for example, they have higher ability to adapt to the environment, uh, interact with the environment, adapt to con complex conditions, interact safely with humans, have easier access to confined areas, and handle fragile objects. In other words, while conventional robots are designed to perform tasks in a controlled environment, these robots can face unstructured conditions. The actuator based on nickel hydroxide oxide hydroxide has, with its lifelike movement, has great potential in, robotics, in soft robotics. A promising application would be a light responsive soft gripper that can grip manipulate and release objects. By fabricating the actuator into an X shape, we are able to create we are able to transform the two-dimensional actuator into a three-dimensional gripper. As demonstrated in the video here, the gripper can hold onto the object when eliminated and release once the light is removed. In contrast to rigid fingers, the use of soft material gives many advantages. For example, it does not leave marks onto the object being handled. The stability of grasping also increases since the fingers can conform easily onto the object. Moreover, less force is sufficient since there is a higher friction between the finger and the object. The soft hand is perfect in applications such as handling delicate organs in surgeries, handling eggs in the poultry industry, or maneuvering any fragile material in general. It allows engineers to realize strong, simple, compliant, yet, yet strong manipulation system. 
On the other hand, the actuator can be used to fabricate miniature and assemblyless robots. As demonstrated on the left here, by selectively electroplating the hydroxide onto the substrate, we are able to create hinges that where the bending is localized to. And if we fabricate, if we electroplate three actuating hinges onto the substrate, we are able to create a robotic arm with three joints. When illuminated by light, the robotic arm folds up. And to put its ability into test, we connected a 25 milligram sponge, which is around 100 times heavier than the actuating material, to the free end of the robotic arm. The sponge can be lifted by 10 millimeters when illuminated by 100 milliwatt per centimeter square of light. On the other hand, if we can use the same technique to make an insect-like walking robot, by selectively electroplating two actuating hinge, we are able to create two joint, a two-joint robot. And between the joints, we build a light, <coughs> a light locker such that only one of the hinge will be illuminated when the light incidents horizontally. And as, and as demonstrated, the robots can walk slowly towards the light. As we can see, these robots do not require any electrical or mechanical assembly process. Moreover, their soft and flexible body allows us to engineer robots that can fly lighter, slither into narrow spaces, and operate in smaller spaces we never previously imagined. Moreover, their miniaturized body allow our carpet application where heavy and larger machines become prohibitive, such as in space exploration or in search and rescue operations. Apart from making miniaturized robots, this material is, can be easily scaled up to give larger deformation and force. In particular, we are able to make artificial muscles to power robots. By strategically assembling two actuated fill, as illustrated in the diagram here, we are able to convert the curling motion of the actuator to give vertical lifting movements. And by combining several of these assemblies together, we are able to create muscles that contract and expand like real muscles. And unlike robots that are built from rigid materials, this flexible body allows a higher adaptability when performing tasks. Moreover, it allows us to develop robots that can interact safely with humans. Since their body is deformable, it has less inertia and are less likely to cause bodily harm. And we can now build robots that work, close in, work in close proximity with human. At this point, we're not even close to realizing the full potential of the, of the actuating material. A very promising research direction would be to uh, find different modes, find other modes of actuation, such as twisting and origami photo. And these will allow us to make even more complex and magnified movements. Moreover, origami robots are particularly interesting because it allows us to build reconfigurable robots that can fold themselves into any arbitrary shapes. On the other hand, if we are able to describe the motion of these actuators in an analytical, numerical, or experimental approach, it allows us to know more about the actuation behavior and hence predictive models that allow us to come up with more innovative applications for the actuator. In conclusion, we have introduced a light assimilated actuator based on nickel hydroxide oxide hydroxide. It is an important addition to the known group of smart actuating material. All in all, I would say this is a pretty exciting time for robotics. Though it's still in its early time of development, soft robots imposes new and challenging questions to the robotic community. And indeed, it is, we are still learning to control these flexible structures and there is still a long way to go. 
However, there is one thing I know for sure, is that robots in the future will be softer, smarter, and safer. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Selena. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Okay, we've just seen Selena's Hi. presentation. Light stimulated actuator based on nickel hydroxide, oxyhydroxide for robotics. We will now commence our QA session. We will begin with our judges and followed by the questions from our audience. Terry? Oh, thank you, Sam. Uh, Selena, that was a fascinating presentation. Uh, really interesting technology. So thank, thank you for that. Uh, I learned something. Let me, uh, let me ask you uh, I've got two little questions for you here. The first one really is. Uh, obviously, we're looking at photosensitive materials here that react to light. Um, you, you used uh, nickel um, hydroxide, oxyhydroxide as your, your material of choice. Did you also consider other materials? And, and, and if so, why did you consider that particular material for your robot? Uh, uh, the reason why I choose the material nickel hydroxide, oxyhydroxide, uh, apart from other material, is because this is the only material that are able to be actuated by both uh, electromechanical currents, electro electrical currents, and visible light uh, humidity change. So basically, there isn't any material that are able to be actuated by such a diverse methods. So that is the reason why I would like to use this material other than others. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. And then the, the second question really is, uh, you showed us a few different applications, which were really, were really practical applications. Uh, I, I saw the one uh, we're using it as sort of a bustle, um, and that shows it's kind of scalable to a certain level. Um, what's the limit on its scalability? Uh, you know, what's the limiting factor that would stop you making an absolutely huge one that could lift really high loads? What's the limiting factor? Ah, that's a really interesting question, actually. So, to, in order to uh, explain its limitation in scaling up into larger application, I will have to explain a bit on the fabrication of the material itself. So basically, the tri-layer actuator is fabricated through electrodeposition, and we have to conduct three, three different electrodeposition in order to form these three different layers. And basically, we have to do it in the map where there's some beakers and mm -hmm. we have to pass on different voltage. And this is the limitation. Because we do not have a large equipment to fabricate a really large strip or piece of actuator, and therefore it, uh, it imposes a lot of limitation on the scale. However, mm -hmm. To tackle this limitation, we can connect different small pieces, small strips together, and it would mm -hmm. give the same effects. Okay, Selena, great answer. Thanks very much. And uh, over to, to Joe. Hi, Selena. Very well done. It's a complex um, sort of project to get across. You did great. Well done. Um, my question is a, is a little bit sort of outside maybe the, the field of robotics, but but it's technology that I've never heard about before and really interesting. Do you see uh, sort of any applications for this outside the field of robotics at all? Mm -hmm, certainly. Uh, actually, during the project that I did, we looked for other application other than robotics. For example, in it is very useful in harvesting renewable energy because as mentioned, the actuator are able to be stimulated by humidity change, visible light, and um, yeah, basically these two of uh, renewable energy sources. And by connecting the actuator to, for example, piezoelectric crystal, we're able to transform the mechanical movement into electrical currents. And in this way, we are able to harvest different renewable energy sources. Thank you, that's really helpful, thank you. Hi Selena, that was really, really good, very informative, and I like that you had um, an actual physical example so we could see how it worked. 
Um, I know a little bit about robotics, but not as much about soft robotics. So my question is, how far do you think we can take soft, soft robotics and technology in the future? Definitely. Uh, as mentioned in my presentation, we are still in a very early stage for soft robotics. And uh, we definitely could develop so much more using these kind of soft materials in robotics. For example, uh, for a conventional and traditional robot, it is often very rigid and cannot really interact well with the environment. In contrast, the soft robots are able to uh, allow more mistakes. For example, in my presentation, I show a robot that misses the mm -hmm. doorknobs. However, if we replace the robot with the robot arm or fingers with softer robots, there is a larger margin allowable for the mistake that the robot makes. So there is definitely a very large potential for soft material in robotics. Thank you very much. Thank Hi, you. Selena. My question Hello. is actually expanding from what Carla, Carla asked. Ali asked this now. Now you talk about soft robots. In your research, if you look at a household, what would be some of the parts where you can use soft robots in the household? Is it practical to use in your household, in the homes? Um, yes, I would say so. Um, for example, we could, uh, there is an increasing trend of household implementing system to harvest renewable energy to be used within uh, people's home. And I would say if we're able to scale up the actuator into a larger scale, we are able to harvest enough energy that are able to use within houses. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our judging panel. Selena, we have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the first question, what barriers can you see for this being used in the future? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, we have faced certain barriers when it comes to fabricating the actuator. For example, the uh, reactivity of the actuator tends to decrease and does not show as much deformation and force when compared to freshly made. And I think that we uh, definitely, this imposes a lot of challenges when it comes to realizing a long lasting robotic applications. However, we are actively developing new uh, electroplating recipe to make the tri-layer actuator and we have been successfully in making a actuator that have that can show longer lasting force and deformation basically okay thank you and our second question nice presentation what would be the fatigue life of the thin layer gripper and how can it, can it be improved ah uh in, we actually conducted uh, several fatigue cyclic tests on our actuator, and it is able to demonstrate the same actuating strain for over 5,000 cycles. And as mentioned, uh, the so basically, I don't think there is uh, the the material face a very large uh, decrease in reactivity when it comes to fatigue. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions from the audience, um, I would, any, any other questions from our judging panel? Uh, Sam, if I, if I can just ask one additional question, sure. which is really following on from something that Selena's just said, really. So Selena, when you were speaking to uh, Stephen, uh, you mentioned about possibly um, using this uh, sort of technology to generate energy in a domestic situation. Uh, so it's presumably using light to generate some sort of mechanical movement and extract uh, electrical energy from that. Um, 
do you have any any thoughts as to whether that that will be um, better or worse than photovoltaic that we see in uh, normal solar panels? Uh, uh, definitely, I think the, the material when comparing to photovoltaic is definitely not as strong because photovoltaic in photovoltaic we basically transform the light energy from the sun directly to electrical currents. However, if we are to use our actuator to harness uh, renewable energy, we basically we first have to transform the light energy into a mechanical movement and then to electrical currents. So the intermediate stage in uh, between light energy and electrical current definitely lowers the e efficiency of the actuator. Really good answer. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Selena, we have a question from the audience. It's a bit long, okay? So just bear with me and I'm happy to repeat, okay? Okay. okay. So the instrument is induced by visible light, meaning it is only operable when there's visible lights. What happened if visible light is not available? We are talking about applying these robots and robots sometimes operate in hazardous environment where visible light could be limited. Won't these conditions hinder or limit its future applications? <laughs> ah, that's a really interesting question. Um, first of all, the actuator can be actuated by other stimuli apart from visible light, namely uh, electrical current and change in humidity. So this, uh, these two other methods can definitely help the uh, robots that are fabricated with this actuator to work in an environment that do not have enough or no visible light at all. And second of all, in the project that uh, in previous projects, we actually tested the compatibility of our light-driven actuator with optical fibers. So by transmitting a light source through optical fibers, we are able to actuate it, actuate the actuator within a long distance. So if even if an environment does not have visible light, we are able to transmit light from a long distance away to actuate the ro to actuate the robots. Okay. Okay, no problem. And I, if there are no more questions uh, from our judging panel or audience, I think we can move on. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you so much, Selena. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. <laughs> thank thank you, you again for your presentation and your questions and answers. Okay, moving forward, we will now move on to our third presenter for today. Today we have for our third presenter from Southeast Asia, Christine Tan Shinmin. Christine graduated this year with a bachelor's degree with honors in mechanical engineering from the National University of Singapore. Christine has spent seven amazing months working in an internship with Airbus Asia training center in the quality assurance department where they house all the Airbus range of planes. Today, we will be seeing her presentation, Facial Recognition and Augmented Reality or Biometric Future. Again, I encourage our audience to partake in our Q&A session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Christy and I represent the Southeast Asian region in the Speak Up for Engineering competition. Now, this is a site we already get to see today. A sea of people all crammed together without even wearing masks. Now, I'm not here to reminisce about being in a large crowd. I want to play a game to see how attentive you'll be to my presentation. And the game is, where's Wally? -E? Now, can anyone find Wally? -E? No? Let's make things a little easier. There he is. Did anyone find him? Congrats if you found him and stay tuned to the end of my presentation for your prize. Now, why would I choose this game to kickstart my presentation? I have found a way that I can easily find Wally -E, or in fact, anybody in the sea of people without them needing to wear this stripped attire. And that is all thanks to the technology of facial recognition. 
Today, I'll be talking about facial recognition and augmented reality or biometric future. By the end of the day, you'll know how powerful your face can be thanks to the advancement of the technology and artificial intelligence. This is an overview of my presentation. Firstly, I'll go through the introduction and background of facial recognition. I will also talk about the real-life application of this technology and followed by the theory and algorithm behind it. I'll also be talking about the pros and cons that it has to our society and what the future holds. Lastly, I'll give a concluding note together with the prize that I promised. Accurately identifying people has up to this day been a very human process. The human ability to identify people and things by sight is quite a unique form of identification. Facial recognition is something we've evolved to do. In fact, we have a whole area of our brain dedicated to it. This area of the brain is well primed to recognize recurring patterns and faces are just another pattern for us to solve. Even though social media sites such as Facebook Artificial Intelligence Lab can now recognize faces with 97% accuracy, which is merely 2.8% less accurate than a human. Now let's move on to the real life application of this marvelous technology. The most common form is application of this technology is on your smartphone, where the phone can recognize its owner, unlock the screen, and essentially it has replaced the need for passwords or fingerprint verification for certain apps as well. Your face can also be used as a passport or boarding pass in some airports today. It can also be used for the simple task of granting access into schools and offices, which would also serve as a form of attendance taking. On to more controversial usage of the facial recognition technology will be how China has been using it to survey and detain people uh, suspected of crimes in the Xinjiang region and even more recently in the Hong Kong protests. Having their face recognized by cameras could have detrimental impacts to the protesters. Its facial recognition technology is so advanced it was able to locate a BBC reporter wandering across a city of 3.5 million people in a mere seven minutes. Law enforcement agencies across the United States have also rapidly adopted facial recognition surveillance. The largest facial recognition surveillance is operated by the FBI called the Next Generation ID system that maintains a facial recognition database with photos of more than 117 million Americans. The FBI com uh, conducts an average of 4,000 searches per month to identify individuals with its facial recognition system. Its database is comprising primarily of driver license photo database and the city and states provide it to the FBI in exchange for usage of their facial recognition surveillance system. Now, what technological breakthrough will be complete without marketing people getting their hands all over it, right? Some supermarkets in the US are already training smart shelf cameras in the aisles to identify customers' age and gender. It uses such information so the store can market to specific customers' profile and build a behavioral profile that links their in-store activity with their online activity. Amazon built its facial recognition uh, technology called Recognition and its curated photos of their customers' online profiles and shopping experiences, as well as images from its Ring Doorbell security application to put together a profile in order to efficiently market products to individuals. The solution could recognize as many as 100 people in a single image and can perform face match against databases containing tens of millions of faces. Not only does this technology allow for recognition and data mining, it is also used uh, every day in social media apps for the simple and frivolous purpose of entertainment. I'm sure we have all used Snapchat, Instagram and AR emojis uh, to entertain ourselves with the cute and quirky filters. This is the augmented reality usage of facial recognition. For some, it is imperative to their careers. Hashtag social media influencers and TikTok stars. So how does facial recognition work? Here is a simplistic breakdown of the thought process flow for the technology. There are two main components to do this. Firstly, facial detection. Secondly, facial recognition. 
In between the two components, there are mainly three more steps. Creating a database, extracting the features, and training the software. Step 1. A picture of your face is captured from a photo or video. And this goes on for multiple people, hence creating a library of faces. Each face is unique to each person, acting almost like one's thumbprint. Step 2. Facial recognition software reaches the geometry of your face. Key factors include the distance between your eyes and the distance from forehead to chin. The software identifies and extracts the facial landmarks that are key to distinguishing your face. The result? Your facial signature. Step 3. Your facial signature is a mathematical formula and is compared to a database of known faces. And then, step 4. A determination is made. A face print will match that of an image in a facial recognition system database and produce a verified outcome of the identified person in the profile. Next, we'll dive deeper into the mind of how our computer performs the task of identifying people like we do. Also known as Convolution Neural Networks, CNN, are the models that allow computer vision to scale from simple, simple applications to powering sophisticated products and services, ranging from face detection in your photo gallery to making better medical diagnosis. They are one of the key methods in computer vision going forward and, and it is in the heart of many present-day innovative applications making it worth to deeply understand. The key here is to get a deep neural network to produce a bunch of numbers that describe a face, also known as face encodings, that pinpoints features of a face. The neural network needs to be trained to automatically identify different features of faces and calculate numbers based on that. The output of the neural network can be thought of as an identifier of a particular person's face. The output of the neural network will be very similar and close when it is passed through the same person, whereas if you pass the image through a different person, the output will be very different. It also enables the computer to differentiate skin tones by studying the contrast of the person in the picture by pixelating the image and then scanning through the image pixel by pixel. And then generating numbers based on the color intensity that it captures. And then there is a whole lot of math that goes into it, which I will spare you guys by not getting into deep. But yes, this seemingly simple thing that we do on a daily and almost intuitively process is not so simple for our computers. Since the start of my presentation, I'm sure the benefits of the facial recognition system has come true in one way or another. Hence, to weigh the pros and cons of this technology, I would like to start with the dangers that it poses to our society. Now, now I invite you to look at these four videos of Obama, and I want you to guess which one out of the four videos is the real Obama. To help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. The results are clear. America's businesses have created... Have your answer in mind? Great, because actually none of these Obamas are real. This brings me to my first examples of the dangers of facial recognition. This is all thanks to the technology we call deepfakes. It refers to the manipulated videos or other digitally representations produced by sophisticated artificial intelligence that use fabricated images and sounds that appear to be real. The word deepfake combines the term deep learning and fake. In simplistic terms, deepfakes are falsified videos made by means of deep learning where the algorithm can learn and make intelligent decisions on their own. A deep learning system can produce a persuasive counterfeit by studying photographs and videos of a targeted person from multiple angles and then mimicking its behaviors and speech patterns, as we have seen in the previous example. Here is a side-by-side -side example of an audio clip that has been extracted from an interview with Obama made decades ago 
and a counterfeit video that mimics the audio clip right beside it to show just how convincing deepfakes can be. Election symbolizes some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important to keep the focus on uh, the, the broader world out there and, and see that. Uh, once a preliminary fake has been produced, a method known as Generative Adversarial Network, GAN, makes it more believable. The GAN process seeks to detect flaws in the forgery, leading to improvements in the counterfeit, hence addressing the flaws, and after multiple rounds of detection and improvements, the deepfake video is now completed. But the danger of that is that the technology can be used to make people believe something is real when it is not. A deep fake can be a perfect weapon for purveyors of fake news who wants to influence everything from the stock markets to uh, elections. In fact, AI tools are already being used to put pictures of other people's faces on the bodies of porn stars and put words in the mouth of politicians. Moving on to danger number two, security and privacy violations. There are many concerns uh, surrounding the existence of facial recognition software. One example is this company called Clearview AI, who devised a groundbreaking facial recognition app. You can take a picture of a person, upload it, and get to uh, see all the public photos of that person, along with links to where those photos appear. The system whose backbone is a database of more than 3 billion images that Clearview claims to have scraped from Facebook, YouTube, and millions of other websites, going far beyond anything ever constructed by anyone. The software company was largely unknown and was able to remain under the radar by advertising directly to law enforcement and security professionals. However, this changed when the New York Times expose in January 2020 brought its capabilities to the public's attention. The expose prompted fears and widespread concern for personal privacy protection. By today, there are already four class action lawsuits filed against Clearview AI. Major tech companies have also made their thoughts on Clearview's technology known. In January, Twitter sent uh, Clearview a cease and desist letter claiming its policies were violated. They demanded that Clearview AI delete any data collected from its platform. Soon after, LinkedIn and Google sent their own cease and desist with similar policy claims. Facebook also released a statement demanding that Clearview stop using their image data lifted from their user's profile. In a more forceful response, Apple suspended Clearview's developer account and Apple explained that the company had violated its enterprise developer's program in terms of service and essentially disabled the iOS version of the Clearview AI app. Companies capable of releasing such a tool have refrained from doing so. For example, in 2011, Google's chairman at the time, Eric Smith, said it was the one technology the company had held back because it could be used in a very bad way. With the explosion of the internet and businesses making their presence in the digital sphere, Facial recognition technology is an industry that will likely expand exponentially. Cyber criminals and fraudsters are currently growing more rampant. The increased ratio in digital fraud, cyber crimes, and data breaches is driving the digital identification market to grow. Moreover, the stringent regulatory process of the authorities to deter financial frauds by identifying customers' identities is pushing businesses towards the adoption of identity verification services. The digital ID verification market is expected to grow to $12.8 billion by the year of 2024. And there are currently multiple IT companies that are developing various ID verification solutions for the businesses to efficiently verify and authenticate their users in real time. Nothing can be more accurate and secure than biometric verification. According to a study by Spiceworks, 90% of the businesses will be using biometric identification by the year of 2020. Face verification is no doubt the quickest and efficient, most secure solution for ID verification. Developed on the latest facial technology, te facial recognition technology, it identifies the users on the runtime without any delay. Unlike passwords, hackers can't steal or exploit biometric data in everyday life. 
We identify people just by looking at their faces, not their fingerprints or retina. Similarly, in an online world, face verification is a productive way to not only verify the user's identity, but also for authentication. Secondly, the future of facial recognition has been greatly impacted by the unprecedented events of the century. It is projected that face mask wearing will become the norm for at least a proportion of us. An expert forecasts a future with more pandemics, rising level of air pollution and so on, that will mean that face masks are here to stay. Political activists wear masks to evade detection on the streets, like the Hong Kong protests mentioned earlier, and Black Lives Matter protests have reinforced a protesters' desire to dodge facial recognition by authorities and government agencies. Hence, facial recognition will have to figure out a way where they can maneuver around this. Currently, some technology can create a 3D image of a person even though they are wearing masks, which is quite amazing if you think about it, but yet fearful because it seems like we are not even given the option to protect our identity. So there are two ways the future of facial recognition can grow. On one camp, there are companies who are driving the efficiency of facial recognition higher, creating the ability to recognize people even with face masks on. On the other camp, there are companies who want to help the society safeguard one of the most precious and sensitive part of our existence, which is our face and our identity. By now, I am sure that we will have two camps of people. One will be for facial recognition and one will be against facial recognition. Now, if you are for facial recognition and you believe in the advancement of such technology, by all means, uh, continue to snap your selfies and help the algorithm improve. However, if you are like me and you feel that this seemingly harmless technology will be very dangerous should it falls into the wrong hands, mask up and delete all your pictures on social media. <laughs> Just kidding. I have come to the end of my presentation and as promised, this is my very special gift for the smart people who have guessed my questions correctly. On the left, you'll find a QR code uh, for a special filter for anyone who has an Instagram account. Once you have downloaded it, we have our very own Speak Up for Engineering filter that I made for everyone here today. And thank you once again for paying attention to my presentation. And I wish you all the very best of health. Stay safe. Hi, good day, Christy. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we've just seen Christy's presentation on facial recognition and augmented reality, our biometric future. We will now open our Q&A session with our judges and, of course, encouraging our audience to ask any questions they may have on the chat box. So thank you, Terry. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christy, and, and welcome. Um, I'm really worried now, having heard your presentation. <laughs> it's... Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's really, it's fascinating technology, it really is. And obviously we read about it in newspapers and on the TV now. Um, it is going to become part of our lives in some way, shape or form. But with your, with your knowledge now and your informed view, if I asked you to tell us what you think the situation will be in 20 years time, right? what would you say to that? How will it affect our lives? I would say that we will. Oh, unmuted. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I believe that this will be um integrated into our daily lives because currently I'm working in the office building and almost ninety percent is actually entering the building with facial recognition already, and with almost no downtime. So. I feel that people will actually start to embrace it, just like we did with our smartphones. Like most of us, uh, especially with the iPhone, you will use your facial recognition software. And then once it's being integrated into the daily lives, like in the building or in schools, I think we will embrace it just because it's so much easier. You don't need to, we don't need to fear that we're going to lose our pass or keys or anything. You know, we just have our face all the time. We can never forget our face. So we'll definitely embrace that. But at the same time, I... I think we'll see an increase in the criminal, like cyber crimes, where because our face is easily obtainable, you know, you can't hide your face, and it's available like online, and we are we are living in such a digital um, 
socially digital world. So it's actually very easy to steal our identity. But I also believe that due to the nature of this, there will be software companies that will be coming in, creating a whole new industry to actually prevent um, these crimes from happening. So I think we will see a very interesting uh, turn of events and interesting technology that we haven't seen as of yet since uh, the facial recognition technology isn't as widespread and isn't used um, so much in all the countries. Maybe in more like technically advanced country it is more rampant. But once it becomes something that is being used globally, then I think mm. we'll be surprised with what the technology um, can do to bring facial recognition forward, but at the same time, create uh, barriers to prevent crimes. Yeah, which mm. I, I can't really predict what will, what will be thought of by the big tech companies. Yeah. Okay. Well, Christy, which, um, which nations do you think are currently ahead? You've, met, you've mentioned China, you've mentioned America. Are those the top two nations in the globe currently? Um, I believe countries like Japan, they are also using it. Um, but I think the reason why I mentioned China and US uh, specifically is because uh, for China's case and US case, they really uh, engage their police uh, force to utilize it. And from where I come from, Singapore, we don't use that currently for our security forces because mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of legal um, actions against it. So that's why I, I mainly use uh, US and China. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Christy. And uh, over to Joe. Thank you, Terry. Hello, Christy. Hey. Um, I think I'm going to be thinking about this topic all day now. It's it's really sort of put my mind sort of buzzing around it. Uh, it's really interesting. Um, I think also I'm, I was really in, um, interested in the science behind the technology, which I hadn't understood before today. So so thank you. Um, my question is 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 around this sort of the positives and the negatives uh, around it. Um, do you think perhaps that technology has developed faster than we can perhaps regulate uh, this technology? And if so, if you think that, what else do you think could be done to try and um, mitigate the negatives that, that are clearly uh, there? Um, I definitely agree that um, the technology is advancing way faster than the legal uh, the legislation because uh, many people are not aware that they are being tracked, Yeah, that their face is actually a data and that it can actually be used. So just by the mere fact that such things is happening, I'm sure that um, our legal side has to catch up with the technology side because, um, I mean, um, I would say our face is an asset because one day it will be used to unlock anything private like um, your phone, your banks, and even when you make purchases online. So if people are not aware that their face is being uh, harvested for data by multiple tech companies, then um, it's definitely against like human rights and stuff like that. So the legislation will have to step up. Um, sorry, what was your second question? I kind of missed. It was, it was around what yeah. do you think could be done to try and mitigate some mm -hmm. of the negatives that, it, that exist in this area? Yeah, okay. Um, so from our government, we hope that they'll support um, by actually making it um, regulated for companies to utilize our face for you know, for clearance or anything. But um, from our side, I've seen a company that has developed a face mask where it can actually distort or prevent the cameras from actually detecting our face. Because um, in my presentation, uh, right now the technology can even see through your face. So it's definitely being used now, especially in China. Um, even with your face mask on, they can recognize you because they are making a 3D projection. So in order to mitigate this, like from a personal level and individual level, you can use the mask where there are actually printed dots on the mask. So you will actually confuse the cameras. And in a way we are fighting uh, back with the technology because we're making it difficult for them to recognize us. And so far, I think for the individual, that's how we fight back with the technology. If you choose to keep your facial uh, features private, um, if you don't want it to be on the air, and then um, you can also choose not to have your face you know, not to post too much pictures on Facebook or Instagram is a choice because no one's forcing all of us to have our faces there. And um, because one day it can be a very uh, integral 
uh, feature. It's as if you are putting your bank uh, passcode on the internet. Yeah. Mm. So in that way, um, the individual and the government should work together to fight back. As in, people should just have the choice of whether or not they want to um, use their face as um, as any source of power to represent themselves. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Joanna. Hi, Christy. Um, the question I had for you, Terry asked it already, so you've already answered. Um, so I just want to say that was a really good presentation. Um, it's very in keeping with how yeah. we live our lives um, every day. And I tried to scan the QR code, but it didn't work um, in more oh, country, no. So um, you created a whole filter. So that's really, really good. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Christy for that nice face recognition knowledge that we had. So it looks like we got to be very careful nowadays. Now, my question is, <laughs> in your opinion, will banking go into face recognition? What's your opinion? My opinion of banks using facial recognition? Yeah. Um, okay, in my opinion, banks are very careful. So even when, um, Currently in my country, we are using voice recognition. Yeah, we haven't used facial recognition, but we use voice recognition. And um, I've heard that um, because voice is a lot more easier to mimic, correct? We also can extract a uh, voice. And then from what I've heard from banks, my friends in the banking technology sector, there are a lot of um, software engineers at the back who are able to detect the forgery if anyone attempts to do so. So I feel like because banks have such a reputation to protect our, you know, our money and stuff like that, um, it I think banks can embrace it, but at the same time, they have to ensure that the software engineers uh, working at the background can um, be more advanced than the cyber criminals. If anyone attempts to use a facial recognition to um, fraud to do any fraudulent activities, um, but at the same time, I also believe that. If banks were to embrace uh, facial recognition technology and is the most advanced, most secure version, um, then it's definitely very good for all of us because it's very simple. We'll never forget our card, you know, and we'll never forget our password if we have multiple banks, uh, bank accounts. So I think life will be very easy if banks embrace it. And to me, because banks have quite a lot of money, there's a uh, there's a capital reason for them to invest in such a technology. And I believe that they can do it uh, very well. So I think that they should embrace it. Yeah. Going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to our judging panel. Uh, Christy, we have a question from the audience. Due to the unlimited applications, do you envisage a way of restricting the use of deep fakes? For example, with your Obama deep fakes, is there a way to spot deep fakes on a technical level? Yes. Um, so from uh, what I've researched, actually, if you pass the video through certain software, I'm not very sure about the name, but they are able to detect the um they're able to detect the features which will be um how do I put this? Um, because when the deep fakes are created, it is like the filter, you know, like the beauty uh, beauty fi filter. Actually, during my presentation, I was using the beauty filter, so my face looks like similar in the video. But if you pass this through, pass my video through the the <laughs> software, you can actually detect the slight um changes in my jaw area. So for the deep fakes, it can also do that. But um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, those criminals who are going to use deepfakes, they are going to try to fight back. So it's a constant fight between good and evil. The good will always try to, um, uh, what's that called? Like try to expose the, the deepfakes, but the deepfakes will also try to make their videos even more convincing. So it will just be a never ending battle until one of them becomes mm, impenetrable, I believe. Yeah, but there are softwares that can detect deepfakes. So, just like how we are like trying to detect fake news in the news, right? Because there's a lot of fake news. And so we as humans are being educated on how we can decipher fake news. 
So the deep fakes, um, it will be up to the individual as well. And hopefully technological companies can come in and create software to uh, help us to flag out any fake fake news, fake video, deep fakes, and, and then educate people on there. But I believe you can't stop people from creating deep fakes because it's such a widely applicable um, technology. Because even in my school, I was tasked to do the facial recognition technology and, and all these codes can be found online in OpenCV. Yeah, so there's not, nothing to stop people from trying to use this technology in a bad way. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Christy. We have a, another question okay. from the audience. Any examples of countries or authorities which have imposed any rules, regulations, or restrictions of use of facial recognition or AI without permission from the owner? Okay, so currently US, since they are the most widely used country, they use facial recognition uh, technology and it's only the FBI who is actually legally able to use this technology and they have um, actually enforced laws. So in my example, like the Clear, uh, Clearview AI, they are not technically using uh, the information for a bad thing, but um, many companies and even the government has stepped in to actually regulate their process just because they are, they are a private company, they are not owned by the government. So um, if facial recognition, this data is being held by the government, it's okay. I believe because in a way we, we should be trusting our police and our government. Um, other than US, um, I know that my country, Singapore, is as well because we have this thing called the PDPA, the Personal Protection Act. So all this data is actually very, um, very secure. And if anyone uses your face for anything, they can be legally charged. And um, yeah, so those are the few examples that I can give. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from the audience. For someone who is against facial recognition technology like me, in your opinion, what can be done to further get the public or countries to buy in the idea of implementing recognition? Hmm. To further buy in, I think we as humans, we are pretty simple creatures in the sense that if this technology can bring us ease, once someone realized that, oh my, my face, you will never forget your face when you wake up in the morning and leave the house. Um, and you can unlock your house, your bank accounts, you can even do shopping with the facial recognition technology. And we as humans, we will start to embrace this technology for sure. And then uh, we have to be assured by our government and um, technological firms who hold this data um, that they will not be uh, giving it out, um, this information lightly. And we know that this information will be held by people who we trust then I believe that this technology can be fully embraced by society in a way like um, I believe all of us have our ID numbers, right? Like our personal ID number from our own countries. And then if anyone were to leak out this uh, private information, they will be charged. So similarly, if we have that backing and that assurance from the government that um, should this um, uh, private information, like our facial data, be leaked out, uh, there will be consequences for that criminal and I believe that we'll feel safe and we'll also start to embrace it just because it makes our lives a lot easier. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christy. And thank you to our judging panels. Uh, any more questions or are we okay? Okay, good. Thank you again, Christy, representing Southeast Asia on your presentation, Facial Recognition and Augmented Reality or Biometric Future. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Moving forward with today's proceedings, we have our final competitor for the day. And representing South Asia, we have Fahim Islam Anik. Fahim is a student affiliate member at IMECI from Bangladesh. He's a young enthusiast who recently completed his undergrad degree from the Kulna University of Engineering and Technology in Mechanical Engineering. He believes the universe exists in us as we exist in it, and together we can overcome any obstacles. Today, we will be viewing his presentation, Smart Walking Stick for the Visually Impaired. Again, I encourage our audience to ask questions as well. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. 
This is Fahim Islamonik from Bangladesh and I am a student affiliate member at IMIQ. Let's begin. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 seconds just passed, but a lot has happened within those last 5 seconds. The universe has expanded 46 miles. 17 million new emails have been sent throughout the globe. 21 new babies just came to the world. But none of those are my talking topic today. <laughs> today, I am going to talk about something that is going to justify this background. According to WHO, in every 5 seconds, one person becomes blind. And in every 20 seconds, one children becomes blind. So by the time I in my presentation today, 240 new people, including 20 children, are going to lose their precious eyesight. And that doesn't even cover the whole scenario. Throughout the whole world, there are about 340 million people who are visually impaired and amongst which 45 million people are totally blind. And in my country, Bangladesh alone, there are about 6 million people who need vision correction and 0.15 million people are suffering from irreversible blindness. Now you might be wondering why am I suddenly telling you about all these data and statistics. What motivated me to look all of this up? So let me share with you the story of the beginning. I am a student of Khulna University of Engineering and Technology and one day I had to cross, cross the street in order to buy some groceries. Now suddenly I noticed an old blind lady also trying to cross the street. But to my horror I found that there was a truck standing just in front of her. She didn't notice it. Her traditional walking stick wasn't good enough to identify or detect that. She was simply walking and she was just about to hit, hit the backside of the truck when I rushed to the spot and helped her cross the road. So this got me thinking that a traditional walking stick is just not being good enough. She could have easily hit herself in the head. And there are other scenarios where a traditional walking stick is not going to be enough. So I figured any obstacle that is above, above waist height or chest height cannot be detected with a traditional walking stick. So if there is any signboard or any kind of vehicle, now these are non-living objects. What if any living object comes? living animal comes because that type of scenario is quite common in my country. Suppose a cow comes or any people come or simply any vehicle, any moving vehicle come towards a blind person. Now these are all scenarios where a television walking stick is not enough. So after experiencing that incident and thinking all of those things, I went up to my varsity supervisor. I told him that I wanted to do a project on this particular topic. So yes, that is my presentation topic today, smart walking stick for the visually impaired. Now I am going to take you through the journey of how I actually made a working device that can solve all this problem and more and ended up owning my own startup. Let's begin. Now as you all know, in order to create any kind of product or do any product development, we have to go through background researches. So that is what I did at the beginning. Here you are seeing a wearable device but it has a certain amount of weight and as you can see this is not a stick. Now here you are seeing a walking stick with the integration of different types of sensors but how are these sensors coming together in a single portion and how are these things being designed, designed in a proper way that has not been explained. In this figure again the same scenario is happening no proper design model has been given but only a different type of sensor is used. And again, in this case, an application of the stick is being shown, but no design model is being provided. Now, after going through some of the research papers, I went around and talked to the actual people, actual blind people, what they felt about their traditional walking sticks. So after experiencing that event, going through all of these researches, thinking and talking with people, I found a lot of no's and listed them under the title drawbacks. So I found that there was no proper body design, not much consideration about the price range, and even though technology has gone so far, I'm sad to say that in Bangladesh there are no smart walking sticks. So I wanted to convert all those no's into yeses and make those my features. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, this is a dream and I started walking towards my dream. So in order to do that, I fixed some objectives. I wanted to make a device that is going to be able to detect obstacles without any physical contact and also be able to say, describe what is in front and make the product as cheap as possible 
so the people of my country can use it. Make the product available in market. So yes, those were the objectives. And after that, to help me achieve my objectives, my dreams, I selected certain components. So let's look at them. At first there is this sonar sensor. Now I want to detect obstacles without any physical contact. So this ultrasonic sensor is going to help me fulfill that purpose. Then there is this vibration actuator. What happens is that it simply vibrates and the vibration intensity can be controlled by changing ampere or voltage. So the blind person can feel the vibration intensity in his or her finger and get a feedback based on the distance. Then the Raspberry Pi model is simply being used as the processing unit and to capture images we are going to be using Raspberry Pi camera. So how are these components coming together? That is what we are going to talk in the methodology portion. So as you have already guessed by, already by now that the ultrasonic sensor and the Pi camera these are working as the input units and they are gathering information from the surrounding environment and sending the information to the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi is processing all of this data and getting its power from any kind of battery or power source and as output there is this vibration actuator and headphone. Now the vibration actuator vibrates and the blind person feels the vibration intensity in his fingers and the, and the headphone is going to be used so that when the description is happening what is it, of what is in front he or she can listen it through the headphone. Now how is this happening? How are all those things coming together? Let's talk about that a bit in the control system model. And I have summarized the whole control system into three major portions, power, sonar and camera. Let's look at the power portion. So the device is going to be powered by battery or any kind of power source. The Raspberry Pi is going to get activated and it is going to give power to the sonar sensor, sensor and the Raspberry Pi camera. Now let's look at how the sonar is working. So this thing is very important. The sonar sensor is a <clears throat> distance measuring unit and it is working continuously, dynamically. So the algorithm is set in a way that it tries to see is there any obstacle within the range of 30 to 120 centimeter. So if there are no obstacles, then it is simply just not going to vibrate or give any sort of feedback. But if there is an obstacle, then it is going to identify it and give a vibration feedback. So let us assume this. Suppose this is the state. This is the sonar sensor and these are connected together. So this is a single model and this is the obstacle. So if the obstacle is situated closely, then the vibration is more intense. And if the obstacle is situated far away, then the vibration actuator vibrates less intensely. So based on the distance, the vibration intensity is changing. And that is how the blind person can know how far the obstacle is. And this is a continuous process. So the loop continues. After that, let's look at the Pi camera. How the camera is functioning. Unlike the sonar sensor, this is not, this is not a dynamic process. So the blind person needs to press a switch. So without pressing the switch, it is not going to give any feedback. But if the person presses the switch, it is simply going to capture an image. And after that, it is going to try and see is the captured image within the pre-learned 80 objects or not. So we are using a machine learning model and we have learned 80 objects till now. So if the captured image is within these models, within these pre-learned objects, then it is simply going to say what is in front. And if it is not within these objects, it is going to say there is nothing to describe. Okay, so now that we know how the whole procedure works, let us move on to the CAD model where all these components are going to be placed together. Now there is switch, vibration actuator, Pi cam, sonar sensor and the walking stick. And in this animation video here, you are seeing how are all these components coming together. As you can see, simple nuttel bolt is being used to connect it with the walking stick. A 3D printed body is being used within which the Raspberry Pi camera, the breadboard, the sonar sensor, all the wirings and everything is housed and all of those things are coming together and as in a single place where it is helping me to make the device as a whole. And after the design was done, the actual model was prepared based on the design. As you can see, this device is looking just like as we saw in the CAD model and it is working properly. As you can see, the person can easily move around with the walking stick. But as I mentioned before, the aim was to 
take the model into market. So in order to take the product to market, we need to do performance tests. We need to know uh, is the actual product working or not. So I have categorized the whole performance model into four different sectors. So there is sonar accuracy, safe zone, real time, phase detection and phase learning. Let's zoom into sonar accuracy. So as you can see, there are two cases, case one and case two. Let's zoom into case one. So in the figure here, in the left side figure here, as you can see, as obstacle, there is a rounded column. And I needed to know, is the ultrasonic sensor giving me proper readings or not? Is the actual distance identical to the distance that the sonar sensor is measuring? And as you can see from the figure here, from the graph here, that the actual distance and the measured distance are quite identical and the accuracy is more than 95%. And next, is the vibration intensity changing with the distance or not? So yes, as you can see, with the increase of distance, the vibration intensity is decreasing and vice versa. Okay, so now that I know that it is giving me proper distance reading and the vibration intensity is changing, I simply went to case 2 where I change the front obstacle. Now you can see there is no rounded column but still even in this scenario it is giving me proper distance results and the vibration intensity is also changing properly. Okay now let's go back and let's go to safe zone. Now in safe zone what I did was I need to be able to say within which zone a blind person is going to be safe. So let's look at the experimental setup of how I did that. Now here in this first four positions what I did was I simply stood with the blind walking stick and the whiteboard that you can see worked as the obstacle and it was made to move left to right. So based on the distance of the whiteboard and my positioning, different vibration feedback was found and the vibration intensity for different positions was recorded. Now here all the recorded data is shown where 0 is being the minimum vibration intensity and 100 being the maximum. So it is giving me vibration intensity for different positions. Now this helped me to create this box zone. Now as you can see it is a box zone of 125 cm into 60 cm. So when a blind person is walking this is going to be his safe zone. As the person moves forward the move the box moves with him and as the person goes backward the move box also goes back with him. Now there is a gas. I did this experiment while standing on a particular position. What happens if I move around? So that's what I did next. So here you are going to see what happens in real time scenario. But even in this case, I moved towards the wall and came back to and from movement but still the safe zone box, yes, that is holding true. The distance measurement, that is also being accurate and the vibration intensity change with respect to distance. That is also happening just like in previous cases. So it is also working properly in case of real time scenarios. Now let's look at the image detection and face learning. At first let's look at the setup. So as you can see different types of obstacles have been put. And after that what happens in order to capture an image you need to press the switch. So there are two switches. If you switch press one switch it simply captures the image and then as you can see here in the figure, it is being able to identify all the obstacles that are in front even in this low light condition. It then generates a voice that says there is a person and a laptop in front. In the lower left, there is a bag and a laptop. So yes, it is being able to identify what is in front. But wait, that's not all. There is another switch which can save a person's information, learn a person's face. So let me simply say how this is working. The Raspberry Pi, it creates a hotspot of its own. So just like we connect to any other hotspot, just like we connect to any other hotspot device, we simply connect to that. And this type of interface pops up. So just like we save the contact information in our mobile phones, we simply update that captured image and rename it. So the next time that person comes in front of the camera, it is not going to say there is a person in front. It is simply going to say the person's name. There is Mr. X or Mr. Y in front. So yes, the face learning feature is also available there. 
Okay, so now that we have gone through the performance test and we are seeing that this is working properly, we needed to do some competitor analysis because our goal is to take the product to market. So that's what we did next. Here you are seeing the competitor analysis. But as I mentioned before, in Bangladesh there are no such product. But there is a product named Ultracane, which is a U European product. We work which is a which is a USA based product, Smart Cane, which is an Indian product. And if you look at the look at the features used, you will <coughs> see that the Ultra Cane and the Smart Cane they only use the sonar feature where, where you, you, you can identify obstacles with vibration intensity. But other than that, they are not using anything else. In the case of WeWalk, they are using network and integrated it with mobile devices. But because, but because of the low network coverage scenario in my country, uh, applying that is a uh, luxury that I cannot afford. So other than that, you can see that um, the features that I'm using has a bit of competitive advantage based on all of those things. But the main aspect here is the price range. If you look at the, that Ultracane and WeWalk, this has a price range of $700, $500, not feasible for a country like mine. So I can actually offer this tape within the price range of $60. And the reason all of those things were kept in mind is because I needed to do a proper balancing, a balancing between cost and feasibility and quality and features. Because just making a stick isn't enough. Just making sure that it's working is not also enough. Make sure that the people can actually afford it and use it properly based on the scenario of my country. That was the goal. That was the dream. So that is why making this balance was really, really necessary. Okay. So now the device was working properly. It was giving proper performance tests and I have, I had already, already done the market analysis. But what was necessary after that was to create a team. So that's what I did. I started my own startup and gave it a name Vision IT. And then here you are seeing the management team. And as you can see here, that a lot of young brilliant minds came together in a single platform so that this device can improve, it can have better functionality, the efficiency can be improved, and it can be made available for all the people throughout the nation. And we were guided by the professors of our university and people from different sectors helped us in different ways. But that isn't enough because we need money to do product development or make further improvements or make a lot of devices. So we needed funding. So that is why we participated in a student to startup program which was organized by the ICT Ministry of our nation. And I'm glad to say that among 7,000 teams throughout the nation, we were awarded a grant money of 1 million BDT. And yes, this boosted us a lot. And we went one step closer towards our dream. So now that we had the money, we started thinking how we wanted to go to market. So we started thinking about the supply chain management. So we, were, we are initially thinking of doing the sourcing from Bangladesh, Taiwan and China and then the manufacturing is going to be in Bangladesh and China. The warehousing is going to be in Bangladesh and the distribution is going to be through e-commerce site, medical store, medical instrument store, wholesale and so on. So after all these things have been done, the product has been made better and all the other business, business aspects have been figured out, we want to go to market by the end of 2021 at a particular region of our country and keep growing eventually and achieve a break-even point by the end of 2024 by selling 8,270 units. And I know that making a device and going into business are two different things. There will be flaws, there will be times when it is going to be difficult, but we will keep on improving, we will keep on trying more and more, and we will make sure that we give our best so that we can step, take little steps toward the bigger goal that we had to begin with. So yes, that's the dream. Hope you can achieve it. Keep us in your prayers. That is all. Thank you. That has been my time. Hi, welcome Fahim. Thank you so much for your presentation. We have with us Fahim, from South Asia, and um, we've just seen his presentation. 
smart walking stick for the visually impaired. We will now commence our Q&A session with our judges, followed by the audience. Terry? Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, hi, Fahim. Fantastic presentation. Um, great. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Application of, uh, of technology there. I've got two, two little questions for you here. Um, you, you've explained very well the um, kind of objective performance of the smart stick to be able to sort of see the world around it to detect and, and feedback, haptic feedback to the user. Did you get the chance to do any sort of uh, real trials with blind people to get their feedback? Have you had any sort of subjective feedback from end users? Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, what happens is this, this is not actually the first prototype. This is actually the third prototype. So we tested like in all of those spaces. So at first, when we launched our first product, we went to blind people and gave them the stick. So they felt like that the stick wasn't giving proper data or the vibration intensity, they were not feeling properly in their fingers. And even at the time of clicking switches and capturing images, they were not properly uh, being able to identify what was in front because uh, it was not uh, generating enough uh, voice so that the person can listen. So that was the problem to begin with. So in the next phase, we then try to regulate uh, the vibration intensity based on the di distance a little more so that people can actually find out more. So yes, that happened in the next phase. And then actually what happened in the third phase, we then went to actual blind people more. We actually increased the number. At first we tried uh, people within our surroundings and then we tried to go beyond our regions a little outwards toward medical uh, hospitals and stuff. And then we found out that yes, they are now being able to identify things properly and the vibration intensity is also working properly. But having said that, there are still flaws. For example, uh, one of the blind people have said that uh, Sensing the vibration intensity in one finger is not being enough for the person. So he or she is thinking that what would be better if uh, or like the vibration intensity was for different, uh, was applied to different fingers for different types of distance. So that was the suggestion that we got. And in, also in the case of like facial recognition and, uh, and image processing so that the person can uh, identify what is in front and listen it through the headphone. Even in those cases, we had a certain uh, feedback. So we are now actually trying to modify more and more, make the product uh, to identify what is important even within the less period of time. So yes, now we are still improving and uh, yes, we have gone to actual people. Thank you. Okay, Mahim, very, very good answer. And um, the other sort of curiosity I had was that you, you've obviously uh, developed this around being able to, to work out like, the, uh, the static environment around the, the, the person, the user. Um, obviously in real life, it will be um, a dynamic environment that, that changes. People can walk past, you can have cyclists and things like that. I mean, will it cope with that, or is that a future development of the product? Okay, thank you for the question. Well, actually what happens is that I have actually mentioned that in my presentation, there is going to be a safe zone box. So if any obstacle comes, even when the person is walking dynamically, within the region of a 60 centimeter and 125 centimeter box, if any obstacle comes, there is going to be a vibration feedback based on the distance and how far the obstacle is. So yes, even in real time scenarios, for example, like if people passing by or a tree suddenly coming in front, it is going to give the vibration intensity feedback. So that has been covered uh, now. Actually, we are actually now focusing more on the like facial recognition and image processing because the uh, identifying obstacles based on the distance and the sonar feedback that has now been quite optimum and uh, it is giving really, really good feedback for the present time. Okay, thank you for him. Uh, no more questions for me. Over to Joe. Thank Hi, Fahim. Hello. Um, great presentation. I think it's always fascinating to see how you can take an engineering and apply it and really help people's lives. It, it, it was great. Thank you. Um, you really sort of demonstrated the journey you've been on right from the start, from the, when you were on that street, right the way through to the end when you were talking about production in China and Taiwan. What, what I'd like to ask is, is what advice would you give to somebody who's at that, that start of that journey for him? What did you learn along the way that you would uh, you would like to uh, advise someone else about? Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, this is a uh, this is something I really wanted to say, and thank you for asking that. The thing is, when you have an idea and you really want to make an impact, make sure you don't stop because there are going to be obstacles. Uh, for example, you might not even have money. Uh, you might not have the proper knowledge. And people might say bad things about you. You are not studying and uh, utilizing your time on this particular topic. People will say different things. So the first thing is make sure that you have that determination that you want to stick on your path and you want to move forward. The second advice that I want to give is that surround yourself with people 
who have similar mentalities. Because in this project, there are a couple of other people who are involved with me. I, I would like to name some of them. There is Rahat, there is Tusha, there is, uh, uh, there are lots of people involved with this. Okay. So what happens is that when uh, these people come together and they have similar mentalities, it becomes easier. Friends share all the sorrows and the burdens. So that's the second advice. The third one is uh, learn and actually try to solve the problem rather than uh, trying to create a project just for the sake of it. So those three were the, uh, the, were the uh, core points that I always had to keep in mind when I was moving forward with this project. So thank you. Thank you. That was my answer. Thank you, Fahid. Thank you. Hi, Fahim. That was really excellent. Um, it's really nice that you're doing something to help people. Um, and I think a lot of people will thank you for it. Um, so you said that you had three different prototypes. How long did it take you to get to the stage you're at now? Um, and how extensive were the changes at each stage? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, actually, uh, this was my final year project. So basically, the whole journey was about one year. So at first, what happened is that only the sonar model was uh, incorporated because as you can see, the different smart walking sticks are only using that feature, the object detection with the sonar sensor. So that was like the first model. In the second portion, we tried to incorporate the facial recognition and image processing. So yes, that was the second model, but it was not giving proper distance readings and also it was not being able to give proper feedback like uh, we actually uh, wanted to, to begin with. So that was like the second phase. And in the second phase model, also what happened was that uh, you can see that there is a 3D printed house, right? Within which all the instruments are coming together, the sonar sensor, the image, the camera, and the Raspberry Pi, everything is coming together. So even that uh, design was not actually proper because it was the wirings and where the battery is going to be placed, all those things were uh, actually flawed. So we had to like redesign it uh, quite a few times so that everything can come within the whole system. So that was basically uh, done in the second phase. And after that, we came to this portion. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Fahim. That was a very good presentation and it's really helping Thank the people. You, In terms of sponsorship, either from the government or non-government, do you have anybody coming forward to, to take on this to be further so that more people can benefit from this? Thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am already getting a fund from the ICT ministry. They are actually funding this and not just funding in my government uh, in my country recently there has been a regulation uh, regarding startup companies so yes they are also giving us incubation opportunities and looking uh, mentoring us arranging different sessions for us so that we can further improve our different features and also the business aspects so yes different organizations are coming together so that we can actually further the development of the product and make it uh, available throughout the country and hopefully uh, beyond borders uh, in future. Thank you. Thank you for him. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you to our judging panel. Uh, for him, we have a couple questions from the audience. OK, our first okay. question is a two part question. So I would read to you part one and then part two. So for him, a very detailed and engaging presentation. First question. However, I would like to know more about the how the vibrations is generated with the vibration activator that you used. Um, that is the part, first part of the question, right? Correct, yeah. You, uh, would okay. you like Thank me to read the second part? Uh, no, and I, what I obstacles you face throughout your journey? Yeah, OK. OK, I got it. I got the second question also. So OK, so for the first one, you asked to know how the vibration is actually generating. Uh, uh, I could actually draw this up if real quick. Uh, so what happens is, if you can see here or not, so there is something like this in the vibration actuator. So there, a shaft actually goes through this portion, this shaft portion, and as you can see, this is a model that rotates. Now, this is actually uh, connected to a shaft, and this is a, a single model, right? So what happens is this, we all know when something that has a very big mass when it rotates, it rotates. If it has, if it does not have proper dynamic balancing, then there is going to be vibrations, right? So that principle is actually used here. So the balancing is intentionally not maintained here. So there is mass on one portion and there is no mass on another portion. So when the current or voltage goes through the system, the shaft rotates, and this is connected to the shaft that also rotates. 
and that is how the vibration is actually generated even in your uh, mobile phone or uh, any other device when there is an alarm system and you feel the vibration this same principle is also happening there uh, i guess that answers the first question and the second uh, question was what are the obstacles i believe i answered uh, the similar question when um, uh, joanna asked me what was the what, was, what advice i would like to give but i'm going to repeat the process uh, some of the aspects that i uh, actually didn't answer there so uh, the ob obstacles that i uh, faced was mostly uh, due to financial conditions uh, because i had to buy a lot of the instruments and i didn't have the money actually uh, but uh, uh, i'm glad to say that my supervisor sir of my varsity he helped me through the process he like uh, actually gave money gave me money out of the po pocket like uh, literally uh, when i needed that so that was really helpful so that was one of the problems that i faced another is that uh, finding people who are uh, actually like minded, minded uh, so that we can come together and um, generate a wonderful device so basically yeah, those were the obstacles that i had to face to begin with okay thank you for him uh, we have another question from the audience. If money yeah. and time wasn't an issue, how far would you like to take this work? Wow, that is a that is an excellent question, and I should have actually talked about it in my presentation a bit more. As you can see, as you have uh, already understood, that we are using artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? Now there are a vast ex uh, exposure and vast field of this particular section, as the previous speaker has uh, talked about it, it, it quite a bit, right? So there is also another uh, interesting thing that can be added here is that uh, suppose there is a um, there is something written on a blank sheet right some text or something like that so uh, we are already using the camera right so we can simply use that uh, uh, device and capture the image of something written on the blank sheet and then it is going to generate voice what is uh, written there so by that the blind person can also uh, read something that is written in a in a position on something like that so see, see, so it's like a vast uh, uh, field that can be actually uh, uh, talked to or actually go, we have to go through so yeah those are the things that can be done in future and um, the thing is uh, just incorporating different types of features is not really uh, the intention of the whole project, as I have mentioned. So yes, there is going to be different types of features and different types of applications based on the technology and how it goes far. So we also have to keep in mind the actual use, usability and feasibility of the whole device. So yes, that's my answer for the question. Okay, thank you for him. Uh, I would thank like you. to circle back. Are there any questions from our judging panel? Any further questions? Okay, and uh, we don't have any more questions from the audience at this time. So we just had for him from South Asia with his presentation, the smart walking stick for the visually impaired. Thank you so much for him for your time. Thank you, thank you a lot. No problem, all right. So that concludes the presentations for today. I would like to announce a short break. Thank you again to all of our competitors. It's been another fantastic day with several enlightening presentations. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm very intrigued and interested in what I've seen today, and I hope you are as well. We will now take a short break where our judges will have
focused on an engineering theme. This year's theme is COVID-19 through an engineering lens. Can you convey your view on this version of the world? Entrants can submit up to three photographs and entries close on the 30th of November 2020. Full details can be found on the iMeki website. Just search for iMeki Photographer of the Year. Good luck. Finally, whilst this week we are finishing off the 2019 Speak Out for Engineering competition, the 2020 competition is now open for entries. So if you've been inspired to speak out for engineering yourself, then get involved. The competition is to be held in a virtual manner this year, given the current circumstances. Entrants must be an affiliate, associate or young member of the institution who has been professionally registered for 10 years or less. Check out the Near You section of the website for locally organised heats. If you would like to know more about the work of the Young Members Board or the International Young Members Committee, or would like to understand how to become more involved with the institution through volunteering, myself, Ankit and our teams will be willing to help. Just get in contact by emailing youngmembers at imeki.org. Thank you all for engaging with this year's Speak Out for Engineering competition. We hope to see you getting involved very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Ben and Ankit. And thank you very much for the information shared with us on the young members of the institution, the opportunities that are available. For those of you watching, if you are interested in learning more, please visit the institution young member webpage for more information. Now, for this part of our ceremony, I would like to interview each participant who you've seen over the past two days, just to hear a few words from our competitors exactly on SOFI and what it means to them. Our first presenter, we have from the Middle East and Africa, Muhammad Hasib Kazim. I believe that choosing to participate in SOFI was one of the best decisions that I ever made. The first time that I presented in SOFI was in 2017, and I lost in the first round. I would have given up, but the encouragement and the constructive feedback of the judges really motivated me to improve and try again. And I'm so glad that I did because Sophie has helped me tremendously uh, in my academic projects as well as uh, in my profession. If I win, I'm just going to jump with joy. And if I don't, it's been an amazing journey and I will keep on improving, learning and relearning. I just want to thank Imeki uh, for giving engineers such an amazing platform to just speak their hearts out for engineering. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed Hasib Kazim, and thank you again for your feedback. I'm now joined here with Okte, and he's representing Europe. Okte, I just have a couple questions as well. What has the experience of Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Thank you. Well, I really do have a big passion for the engineer profession and I find the engineer a really fascinating individual who do insane, cool and important stuff. But in most cases, it is not truly respected by non-technical people as we are working on complex things, which is in most cases difficult to understand by non-engineers. And I want to change that by improving the communication to the outside world to show how great we engineers are. And that is exactly why I also volunteer as department board member at the Royal Netherlands Society of Engineers, next to my full-time job as an engineer. And at the, Royal at the Royal Netherlands Society of Engineers, we organize talks to put the engineer in the spotlight. And by winning this world title in Speak Out for Engineering, this gives me a recognition for all my volunteering efforts to promote the engineer through excellent communication to the outside world. And during the Speak Out for Engineering competitions, I've learned that soft skills are equally important for engineers as the hard skills, as you must be able to work in a multidisciplinary manner with other engineers, where communication plays a crucial role for the success of every project. 
And that's why I've been actively working on my soft skills, uh, like public speaking, ever since. Thank you. Thank you so much, Octi. No problem again. Our next contestant we have, representing the Americas, Jeremy Lalchon. Jeremy, again, the same questions I've asked. What has your experience of the Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Well, hi, are you hearing me now? Yeah. Are you hearing me? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, well, the SOFI competition for me would have started in November of 2019. It's almost a year since um, I was first introduced there. Um, I was challenged to find a project to present on it, and it has been quite a journey. Um, presenting in Canada against um, Jessica was, was really good. Um, she was quite competent. And, um, and while she would have won in Canada, she gave me the opportunity to present at the finals here. And um, I'm much, very much grateful for that. Um, I had to challenge myself technically in doing the study that I would have done. And um, I really learned a lot. Uh, pop, this is about public speaking and being able to express yourself as an engineer. And um, it would have really opened my eyes and, and helped me to develop. Um, winning the Sophie, it would, it would be a, a great accomplishment for myself. I would be um, most grateful. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for your time and for your feedback as well. Much appreciated. I would now like to move forward to the, our representative for the UK, Callum Wilson. Hi, Callum. The questions yeah. again, what has your experience of Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Yeah, so my experience of Sophie has certainly been a really enjoyable one. I've loved being able to talk about a topic that I really love myself, but also being able to share it with so many other engineers and see what they have to share. That's been a really um, beneficial experience for me. And um, I've learned a lot over the course of this. I never imagined when I first applied for the regional event uh, back last year that I would be able to come this far. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, the feedback has been excellent and um, that I've received from all the really talented judges. And I really have to commend the organizing committee and the judges for managing to put together this um, virtual format as well. It really does go to show um, in, in some sense, the challenges that we're able to overcome even in the current environment, we're still able to hold these events and that's excellent. Um, as for if I were to win, well, it would be an absolute honor. Um, already I've gained so much from this and I've had such a great experience. Um, so it's, yeah, to have come this far has meant a lot. Um, to win would be um, something absolutely spectacular. Thank you so much, Callum. Really appreciate your feedback and thank you again for your support. I'd like yeah. to move forward now with our contestant from the Oceana region, Geraldo Higush. Hello, Geraldo. Thank you again for being here. Hi. Questions again. What has your experience of the Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Yes. I enjoyed listening to exciting topics from fellow presenters at each stage of SOFI competition. And as I progress, I gain valuable inputs on my presentation from judges, colleagues, family, industry experts, and I make you mentors. Now that global competition has gone online, I get to reach viewers from all over the world. So winning this competition will enable me to reach a wider audience beyond this event. This is in line with my passion to invite the next generation of mechanical engineers to improve the world through engineering by contributing to renewable energy development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Geraldo. Greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you again, and thanks for being here. Our next contestant that we have, uh, Northeast Asia, 
Selena Yip Wing Hey. Hello, Selena. Thank you again for being here with us as well today. Uh, questions again, for just to remind you, what has your experience of Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Uh, overall, I would say this experience is very fruitful and I am I was able to grow as a young engineer through this experience. And personally, because I always believe that it is essential for an engineer to have uh, good presentation skills because in general engineers we often get a lot of ideas with strong technical backgrounds and details however this isn't enough for a successful idea what makes an idea successful is that we are able to convey the message to an audience or sell our product to a client that may be interested. And this survey experience taught me how to present uh, a complex idea in a sufficiently easy and understandable way to audience with technical or non-technical audience. And in terms of what winning this competition means to me, I would say no matter what the outcome is, uh, it is already a win for me because of all the valuable feedbacks I was able to get from judges and the experience of giving presentations. Okay, thank you so much for your feedback and your participation as well, Selena. We now move forward to our next presenter and for the competition that we have. We have Southeast Asia, Christine Tan Shimin. Uh, again, the questions, what has your experience of Sophie been? What have you learned from the experience? And what would it mean to you to win? Hi, my name is Christy. So back in February of 2019, when I enrolled myself into this competition, um, winning the national round was truly life-changing for me because as a female in a very male-saturated environment, I was always not inclined to speak out about engineering topics because I felt like I wasn't the most technically knowledgeable person among my peers, but winning the competition actually made me realize that uh, what matters is what one speaks from the heart. And if it is a topic that the person is passionate about, it is worth listening to. And along the way, I've met many great engineering friends, especially in the regional round, and I'm sure I'm going to meet them in the global round. So winning this competition would actually reignite my belief that you know we as engineers we ought to speak out more about the topics that we care about and are passionate about because one day we will be the ones who change the world so thank you thank you so much christy and our next presenter that i would like to interview is from south asia for him islamanik and for him what has your experience of sophie been what have you learned from this experience and what would it mean to you to win? Greetings everyone. This is Faim Islamonic from Bangladesh. And Speak Out for Engineering, in general, for me, has been a really great journey. At first I had to take part in the Kumla Regional Zone, and then in the National Round, and then in the SAR Round. And in all of those phases, I got to meet lots of new faces, new minds. I got a lot of new experiences, I got feedbacks of, uh, on how I can improve more. So yes, it has been a journey of ever learning process. And in the global round, all the winners of all those regional rounds are going to come together. So winning this is going to mean the world for me. Not just for me, for my family, my friends, my varsity. Okay, did I, did I miss anyone? For, for everyone. So this is going to mean a lot for all of us. So let's see what happens. Thank you for him. Again, I would like to extend a huge congratulations and warm thank you again to all of our competitors here. It's a, indeed a global competition from Middle East and Africa, Europe, Americas, UK, Oceania, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Now is the time that you guys have been waiting for. And for me, I would like to invite Terry Spall, the head judge and award presenter to officially commence the award ceremony. Hello, Terry. Hello, Sam. Thanks for doing a great job for us uh, yesterday and today. Uh, absolutely first class. 
Uh, well, good afternoon from the UK and uh, well, good morning, good evening or even good night, wherever you are in the world. Um, for those of you that have just joined the, for the award ceremony, um, my name is Terry Spall. I am the, the president of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, uh, headquartered in London. Uh, we're just between the Houses of Parliament and Buckingham Palace, so a really prestigious location. Um, I am the 135th president and I follow in the footsteps of many, uh, many illustrious engineers. Uh, our first president uh, back in 1847 was George Stevenson and he gave the world the locomotive. Well, his achievements go well beyond my own, but my presidency comes after a very enjoyable and rewarding 40 year career in the automotive industry and with 31 of those as a chartered mechanical engineer. So like some of you, I, I started with uh, an apprenticeship and then I went on to university and I graduated from the University of Central Lancashire, UTLAN as it's called these days. Uh, I also held an MSc from Lancaster University as well. Well, through my career, I, I've moved around the automotive industry, spending most of my time in, in technical and then managerial roles with vehicle manufacturers like Leyland, Nissan, and more recently in research and development with Hariba Myra. And I've traveled the world with them. I spent some 10 years responsible for international operations and took a leading role in setting up operations in China, India, Korea, Japan, Turkey, Iran and Brazil. So in my view, international experience is, is so, so valuable uh, to any career as it broadens your horizons and it expands your cultural appreciation. I know, it, I know it sounds glamorous, but trust me, there is more to life than, than airplanes and hotels. And I've always felt uh, you age much quicker when you spend too much of your life at 40,000 feet. But fortunately, in this new virtual world that we live at in now, we can do much more virtually and that hopefully is going to be the way in the future as well. So over the last 10 years, um, still at Hariba Myra, I was commercial director and was involved in creating a 300 million pound automotive technology cluster called Myra Technology Park. It's something I'm really proud of. Uh, and this has probably been one of the most rewarding phases of my career. I mean, to be involved from day one, see it through to becoming a vibrant technology park, employing over one and a half thousand people, 40 companies engaged uh, in all aspects of, of future mobility. We even won the Queen's Award in 2018, the Queen's Award for Enterprise, that's the UK's most prestigious uh, business award. And we even, would you believe, received a visit by the Duke of Cambridge, none other than Prince William, who came to have a spin round our test tracks in an Aston Martin and also experience what it's like to be in a driverless car. So in so many ways, I feel I've been really fortunate to have such an interesting and rewarding career. Uh, and I'd say hand on heart that I've never struggled to get out of bed in the morning to go to work. And I hope you can say the same as you progress your careers. One of the things that's really made a difference for me was very early in my career, um, I developed a, a really strong ability to, to present and to communicate. You know, the development of, of that skill started at university, and I'm sure it has for many of you as well. And I can still remember feeling anxious, physically sick, and having a racing heartbeat at the prospect of having to make a presentation to a large audience. These days, all that anxiety is converted into excitement and passion to absolutely nail it every time. And it's such an important skill for me as it's taken me from apprentice to board director and now to president. Um, I've been on the same journey as many of our competitors as I too was a speak out for engineering competitor, would you believe, back in 1985. And I can still remember going to London and presenting rather badly, unfortunately, on my undergraduate final year project. Um, at that time, the competition was called the Queen's Silver Jubilee Competition with consent from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II following her Silver Jubilee in 1977. Well, the name changed to, to Sophie or Speak Out for Engineering in 2004, but the core purpose you know, is, is unchanged and the competition goes from strength to strength. And it's an absolutely fantastic competition, as you've heard from our competitors. Um, so speaking to our competitors who've made it to the global final, well, you are all winners you've already exceeded my achievements because I failed in the heats. <laughs> and we've heard some brilliant presentations over the last two days, uh, you know, very capably, very confidently, and very eloquently presented. And my thanks to all eight of you for your efforts, uh, really, to, to, that you've put into delivering to such a high standard. Uh, you have really, really impressed the judges. Um, and it's been great, a great honor, great honor for me to be, to be head judge in this competition. And I'd like to thank all my fellow judges uh, for their excellent uh, contribution to the judging process. Uh, it's been my first opportunity to be a judge uh, and I have been immensely impressed, I think it's fair to say, by what I've seen. 
and heard from all the competitors. I was really impressed by the, the effortless confidence that we've seen in these young people. You know, if any of you are nervous, well, you know what, it really didn't show. So you should be very proud of what you've done. And, you know, it's been fantastic to see a truly global event with young members competing from across the world. You know, as young members, you represent the future of our institution, you know, as well as the engineering profession. Uh, and from what I've seen in the past two days, you know, I think that future is in really safe hands. Communicating your ideas as engineers is in some way just as critical as the idea itself. You know, I've found this to be true throughout my professional life. I can think of many occasions where good presentation skills influenced the outcome in my favour. Whether it was pitching to a, a client for a multi-million pound international contract, presenting to an audience of thousands, or even presenting in the House of Commons to government on why they should support us. You know, when you get the chance to make those major, major presentations, you know, as a human being, you will get that adrenaline rush. And the secret I found is to ensure that that drives a positive feeling of excitement and not anxiety. And if you can do that, you will nail it every single time. This year has been uh, especially challenging for all the participants as we've had to move to the virtual world you know and you've had to demonstrate your ability to respond to this changing environment so you know there's a big difference between making a presentation in front of a physical audience where you can be lifted by the face-to-face the -face experience you know that direct engagement where you get feedback and you can react to the mood of the audience and make adjustments far more difficult to be effective with a virtual audience you know, but i think you've demonstrated today that you can adapt your style uh, and you can be effective you know and uh, you know don't get complacent, you know, keep searching for those little tweaks that will always allow you to do it a little bit better each time, because that's that's the only way you become absolutely outstanding in every way. Just keep tweaking and tweaking until you get there. Most of our competitors that I've seen in the last couple of days, you've got there already. It is really regrettable that we couldn't fly you all out to Abu Dhabi for the physical final. It would have been nice to meet you all, but COVID took that away from us. But thinking positively, and every cloud has a silver lining. You know, the beauty of this new virtual environment is that over the past couple of days, you know, we've been joined by members and the general public from all over the world. Uh, you know, you've been seen and heard by a far larger audience than, you know, and you've touched the lives of, of many more people than would have been the case um, with a purely physical global final. So whatever happens in the future, one thing we can never be sure of is that it will be different to what happened in the past. And I think really our challenge now is to embrace that prospect going forward. So thank you again to all the participants. Um, whether I note you as a winner or not, uh, it is such an achievement to get this far and speak out for engineering. Uh, and for that, you should rightly feel proud of everything that you've achieved. So, OK, let me recap on who the global finalists were and what they spoke about. So we had representing the Middle East and Africa, we have Mohammed Asib Kazmi with this presentation on Karam, the Karam knee joint. A brilliant, brilliant presentation and a really great use of technology. Uh, representing Europe, we had Octay Gutlu with his presentation on preventing antibiotics misuse with HTM sensor technology. Again, a fascinating, very practical uh, application. Representing the Americas, we had uh, Jeremy Lalchand with his presentation on an analysis of maintenance and reliability of positive displacement diaphragm pumps. And it, it was quite a, you know, quite a heavy technical subject, but it, it conveyed it so, so well uh, to make it very easy for us all to understand. Representing the UK, we had Callum Wilson with his presentation on, on artificial intelligence. I, I found that really fascinating. Um, you know, it's gonna be part of all of our futures really. And it was good to hear it presented so clearly by Callum. Um, in the Oceana region, we had uh, Geraldo uh, Taguch with his presentation on ocean wave energy. And I, I found that particularly fascinating because you know, clearly sustainability, you know, that journey to net zero is going to be ever so important for all of us in the future. Now, representing Northeast Asia, we had Selena, Selena Yip Winghei, with her presentation on light simulated actuator based on nickel hydroxide and oxyhydroxide for robotics. Well, that sounds very, quite a mouthful, actually, but it was a fascinating presentation uh, on, on some amazing technology. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future. So thank you, Selena, for that. Really, really good. And then in Southeast Asia, we had Christy. Tan, Tan Shi Min, and she gave a presentation on facial recognition and augmented reality in our, our biometric future. Quite scary, really, no respect, but my goodness, did she present it well. Absolutely fantastic. And finally, uh, representing South Asia, we had uh, Fahim Islam uh, 
um, and he, with this presentation on, on the smart walking stick, which is a really practical application of technology to solve a real problem for people who are, who are partially or sighted or blind. So really great job from all of you. So I congratulate you all again. Um, on behalf of myself and the judges, uh, I'd like to thank all competitors. Uh, you know, to know it's been a really tough task for us to judge you and differentiate between your presentations. You know, standards were really high and the scoring was even closer than an American presidential election, if there could be such a thing. So, for, okay, fasten your seatbelts, folks. I'm going to now give you some results. So this is what you've been waiting for. Um, I have two results to announce. Uh, firstly, the runner-up and then the overall winner. So without further ado, it's my very great honour to announce the results. The runner-up in the Speak Out for Engineering Global Final 2019 is Callum Wilson. Congratulations, Callum. Thank you so much. Callum, you delivered a very complex subject so clearly. You started with an overview of the journey uh, you were going to take us on, and you presented with such great style. Um, your visual aids were very clear. And you're, you know, they augmented your presentation really very coherently. And I think you demonstrated to the judges that you really knew your subject well and gave an excellent answers to the questions that we raised. So, so well done, Callum. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Okay. And now, after many, uh, many months of uh, anticipation for the candidates, uh, having had the, uh, the final postponed several times, the moment you've all been waiting for, I guess. So I would like to announce that the winner and overall global champion of Speak Out for Engineering 2019 is Fahim Islam Anik. Well, congratulations, Fahim. Many, many congratulations. Well done, my friend. So that is... So, Fahim, you, from the very start, you took us on a journey that started with a personal observation of a need for a certain aid you know, to help partially sighted and blind people. You made the case and delivered a first class presentation with such great style. Uh, your visual presentation was of exceptional quality, uh, as was your, your understanding of the engineering behind the project. You, know, you described a very full project, taking an idea from concept all the way through to market realization. Uh, you also responded to the judges' questions really, really well. Uh, and that was uh, really the ice on the cake, what was a truly, truly first class presentation. And you are indeed a very worthy winner, uh, Fahi, of Speak Out for Engineering 2019. So many, many congratulations. So Fahim, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you now and I'm gonna ask you just to say a few words. Uh, tell us what it all means to you as our newly current winner. Okay, so can you listen to me? Because I'm a little puzzled right now and I didn't really expect this. Uh, what I can say right now is that I'm so elated and uh, to the whole concept, right? Because I really worked hard for this, uh, for the whole concept of winning, right? I, I actually uh, presented uh, numerous times to a lot of my friends and my uh, and my uh, people that I knew, and they were really helpful through the whole process. So I would like this time to actually uh, thank every one of them who actually helped me so that I could win today. And uh, the feeling is awesome, and I, I actually mentioned it in the uh, previous uh, portion when we, we had to say what it would mean for us if we actually won. So I would just like to say that this is such an honor because I, I didn't actually, I mean, this was this is beyond my uh, expectations. I, I saw the other participants present and they were really, really, really good. And and, and uh, I didn't really expect that I, would, I was going to win. But uh, it, feels, it now feels <laughs> really awesome and I'm really elated at the moment. And I just want to say uh, thank you, Aimeki, for arranging all of these things. Thank you, the organizing committee, for actually making this thing happen. Uh, I, I contacted with uh, Mary Newton. She was always so supportive and giving us all the information. And um, uh, it's a bad thing that due, due to the COVID scenario, we couldn't travel to Abu Dhabi. But still, the virtual platform, as you just said before, is, is still a new thing. So the whole concept and the whole uh, scenario is so amazing that I got to be a part of it and now win it. Now, uh, that feeling is so mesmerizing. I, I just, I, I, I know I, I should say that I cannot explain in words, but you know, I, I, I'm just keeping talking and talking because I'm just so excited. And I, I just, I would 
like to thank everyone and all the judges and everyone out there who has helped me through the journey because I am so so happy. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Fahim, brilliant. I, I love the reaction there. It obviously means a lot to you. So, so many, many congratulations. Um, so, okay, Fahim, it's brilliant to see you win. Very worthy winner. Um, so we're going to leave Bangladesh now. Before I hand back to Samantha in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us over the past two days, competitors, judges, and audience members. You know, your presence has made this competition really special uh, for everybody involved and hopefully truly memorable. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, finally, a huge thank you as well to the IMAC team who've been organising this event. Um, it's not been easy to organise, as you can probably imagine. Uh, we've had many false starts, but we got there in the end. Um, I think you've done a really brilliant job. So as president, I just want to say thank you to all of you for, for all your efforts. You, you've really done uh, an amazing job for us. If we ever get a chance to meet, I'm talking to the organising team now, I'd love to meet and buy you all a beer for your efforts. But that might be some while off yet. We'll have to wait. Um, and thanks also to James and the team at Hi-Viz. Uh, they've provided us with a virtual platform. You've done a great job, guys. Thank you ever much for that. And finally, finally, uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to our Master of Ceremonies, Samantha uh, Diraj. Samantha, you've done an absolutely fantastic job. You've smiled throughout and done it with such great confidence. So thank you, Samantha. Over to you to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Terry. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you guys again for having me as your MC. Thank you again to all of the competitors. It was absolutely brilliant to look at the presentations. To be quite honest, I found them quite fascinating. I hope to meet you all soon in the future. And I do look forward again to keeping contact. Uh, it was a great engineering event over the past two days, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to all of our attendees who has joined globally. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. We really do hope you had a great time. Again, I'd just like to mention, please reach out to your local chapters for any further information if you're interested in participating in upcoming events held by the institution, as well as if you're interested in getting involved. Again, a special thank you to our judging panel for your support and time. To Terry, Joanna, Carly, and Stephen, thank you so much. It was absolutely a pleasure to have you all. To our competitors and our winners, congratulations to you all again. Huge, huge, huge congrats to everyone. Thank you for being here. Have a great one, and I hope to see you all soon. Goodbye.